Ladies and gentlemen, welcome back to the No Laying Up podcast. This episode is a deep dive into the last three U.S. Opens at Pinehurst. Uh, of course, KVV and I have done this over, you know, kind of spanning major championship years, 1995, 96, the likes of that. But we wanted to, in advance of Pinehurst, to get hyped for next week. Look back at 1999, 2005, 2014. We brought TC in uh, as well to cover one of these years to kind of mix it up a little bit. But uh, bring back some Pinehurst memories, get us reminded about the golf course, get us excited uh, for the U.S. Open next week, which I could not be much more jacked up for. Uh, you guys all know Roback, best fit, best feel. It is summer. We are living in this stuff. They just released their American Summer Collection. It's fantastic. Uh, they've got, of course, bathing suits. Now they got the, the performance polos. You guys know about these moisture wicking. They got great stretch. I'm wearing them all summer long. They're great to go on walks on great to wear on the golf course. Uh, if you see me out and about at a golf course, you'll probably see me in a rowback polo this summer. The shorts, the shorts are new. They're fantastic. They've got the everyday shorts, an elastic weight ba- waistband. Uh, it's got extra comfort. They're very clean looking, great to work out in, great to sleep in. They're extremely comfortable. I wear them around the house all the time. The looper shorts, they are the belt, the ones with belt loops. They're great for the golf course, great for a shirt tucked in. Uh, and they got fantastic material, really strong material. And I really enjoy wearing those. The hoodies, this is my big Randy hoodie I've got on today. I saw him wearing this one once and said, all right, I need to have that one. Big, big Randy's just that big of an influencer. So they're my favorite hoodies to wear. My daughter loves them. I love wearing them. They're just extremely comfortable. That's what I'm wearing around my house all the time. Uh, and if you haven't already, load up on some Roback for yourself and for others. Code NLU at Roback.com will get you a generous 20% off your first order through the end of this week. That's R-H-O-B-A-C-K.com. 20% off bottoms, Q-zips, hoodies, and more with code NLU. Summer isn't the same without Roback. Let's get to the pod. Another deep dive episode. We are switching up the format just a little bit. Uh, we have done this in the past, looking at old major championships, right? Going, and we've kind of gone year by year with my guy Kevin Van Valkenburg, who I'll introduce here in a second. But for this one, we are looking at the three previous U.S. Opens that have been held at Pinehurst ahead of next week's U.S. Open, of course, at Pinehurst. We each divided up, looking into each one. My guy KVV took 1999. I took. 2005 and tc welcoming into the deep dive version took 2014 i'll introduce him first hello tc hello excited to come in from the bullpen and, and uh talk some post core crenshaw redesign or restoration pinehurst we didn't have to convince him uh he heard a cleek one in 2014 and he said i've got that one i'm gonna <laughs> i'm gonna do that one but kevin van volkenberg here gonna start us off here shortly hello kevin Solly, it's great to be here. Thank you as always. TC, I promise we'll be gentle in your first deep dive experience. Thank you. I'm very overwhelmed. And and this is a tough one because we were covering golf at this point and 2014, golf Twitter's around. So Mm -hmm. a lot of different things to pull from. I was there, TC. So I'm going to be fact checking you as much as I can. (laughs) Pinehurst is, I'm really excited for the future of Pinehurst. You know, it's going to be a a lot more prevalent in U.S. Opens than the kind of the cadence that it has been over the last 30-ish years. And uh, watching some of the highlights back from 2005, I don't remember a lot from from that time period. I don't remember a lot from 99, but I remember 2014. It was a snooze fest. We're going to get there, but it, it was interesting golf. Like, it's the style of golf. Watching all those chips and stuff, watching the collapses from 05, which we're going to get to, and watching that golf course evolve over the years. I mean, we're, we're, you know, between my, the one I'm going to cover and the one TC covers that place changed a lot. And a lot of the images from 2005 are extremely foreign and unrecognizable, honestly. And uh, it's just such a weird time period in golf. That's the, that's the most fun part of doing all of these is just like the, the weird little time capsules of what's going on and all that. But uh, if you want to, we don't need to delay any further and we can go right into 1999. If you, uh, if you feel ready, Kev. I mean, I never feel totally ready, so I always feel like I'm cramming for a test that uh, has just arrived maybe a few days before I am. But, folks, Pinehurst in 1999 uh, had not hosted a major championship since 1936. Uh, They had made the decision to come there. This was special in some ways because it was uh, one of the first U.S. Opens that played away from the sort of typical super thick rough style they originally set the rough at four inches and cut the rough down to three inches right before they wanted guys to have to choose what what kind of shot they were going to hit out of the rough they wanted to make them tempt them into going for greens uh, at times and not just pitch directly out into the fairway reese jones jr tc's guy uh, said he was the, in charge of the sort of restoration to make Pinehurst get it ready for this. Uh, he said before the tournament, all these guys are mechanical players, like or mechanical players. And Corey Pavin won this tournament in 1995 because he was a magician. 
it's really going to take a magician around here to uh, rather than a mechanic because you have to manufacture shots. Reading this quote made me fear that I had perhaps plagiarized Reese Jones in my artist versus the mechanic uh, debate. Uh, that is not good. I do not feel happy about that. <laughs> it's also Reese Jones, just just Reese Jones. I don't think it's Reese Jones Jr. I think you're conflating. Okay, excuse me. Robert Trent Jones Jr. and Reese Jones. They hate each other. <laughs> <laughs> Also, just I, 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 I'm going to nitpick the word restoration. Like, I don't know if he was in charge of restore. I think re the sure. restoration is what come next. The renovation and <laughs> reification of this golf course. What what do mow lines look like? That was one of my takeaways from from 2005 was that the holes looked pretty comical in terms of how much rough there was and how narrow the fairways were. What what's it look like at Pinehurst at this time, even if it's short or rough? Is it is it narrow yeah. as shit? Uh, it is narrow. It is very dark. It is very kind of um, like it's very green. There is still some of the what you will see, you know, eventually as the like good waste areas that make us feel. But like it's immediately off the rough, it, off of the fairways. It's, you know, a good dark uh, thing. There's a there's a definite like second and third cut. It's not aesthetically pleasing. You can. I will say, though, that it, it really shocked the players. And you'll see in a lot of bitching about just this idea that your ball would not stop if it uh, if you missed the green by a few feet, that it would run <laughs> far away from you. Oh, man, did it piss off a lot of people. Uh, did you guys know that Pinehurst number two hosted the 1991 tour championship? I did not know that at all, which uh, sort of stunned me. I sort of, I guess, uh, you know, more widely known is that it hosted the the senior PGA at one point, but uh, just imagine like going up to, uh, you know, in, in late August and we talk about this, the butt sweats of Atlanta. Well, I think uh, back but... then they had it in October. Oh, uh, okay. it used to be okay. like, That's late. Right, it was like a late, right. like fall silly season event, like end of October, I think, which would have been, prime time there i mean gosh yeah. pinehurst in october is like as good as it gets but imagine just imagine pinehurst if the ball stopped like a foot off the green is kind of hilarious considering what we think of it now at this time david duvall was the number one player in the world uh duvall had won four of the last 12 tournaments and back then man if you won four of 12 uh you were like it was thought of like you were some kind of magician he had recently surpassed tiger as the number one player in the world Tiger was, of course, going through a swing change, which we will discuss in a little bit. Uh, but guess what? This week prior to the U.S. Open, Duvall had burned his right thumb and index finger on a teapot, and he couldn't play any practice rounds prior to Tuesday afternoon at Pinehurst. He had bandaged on, he has heavily bandaged on both of his fingers. He said, they seemed fine. I played this morning, and I didn't really have any problems. It's probably valid to ask me again tomorrow, although I might not want to answer it since that seems like it's all I've been talking about. So you know I love the old timey sports writing uh, <laughs> back in the day, but this is a great like sort of things about with four victories in the last tournament. All Duvall needs is a little confidence. Well, that and a pot holder. Uh, <laughs> sort of the LA Times. Duvall was like leading the uh, the tour basically in driving average. Uh, so like, can you guess what his driving average was that, that back then? He uh, had a two. 94 driving average oh i'm sorry it's 287 Jeez. uh which said that uh, the la times said because of that pinehurst should be right up his alley tiger was also getting hot you know he had famously called butch uh during this sort of thing and said the the butchie i got it uh right prior to this year he had then won in germany and won the memorial ernie ells in a sort of like a horror movie kind of haunting thing that you could sort of echo throughout uh, the time what is to come said it's a little unsettling to see tiger playing so well which would sort of echo throughout the next year or so tiger said prior to the tournament i keep telling everybody that i'm making some changes to my game and it's going to take some time i didn't like the way i played in 1997 even though i won some tournaments i didn't really like it because i wasn't consistent asked what the difference between tiger since he came on tour and now lee jansen who won the previous year's us open said i think he hits it about 20 to 30 yards shorter than he used to he's trying to learn how to tone it down to be a ball control player mm, that probably last Andrew. yeah <laughs> wouldn't last for too long the 99 open is pretty great because a lot has been written about this uh you know because it's sort of like seen as one of the great us opens of the last you know 50 years, maybe even 100 years. Sports Illustrated said it might be the, the all-time greatest U.S. Open. So Alan Shipnuck did a, a lengthy oral history about this. And Paul Eisinger said in 2014, he was talking to Shipnuck, everybody in the world could see Tiger and Phil's talent, but there were still some pretty, pretty big questions about both of them. If you look at Phil, it was still unrealized potential. There was a real question about whether he had what it took. 
A lot of players were beginning to think that Tiger was overrated, that the Masters win was part of a hot streak that had ended. He had hardly won in the two years since, so they came both came in with something to prove. Masters winner Hilary, Jose and Maria Olafable said he didn't think that there would ever be another Grand Slam winner. I would like to be wrong, especially this year. Jose Maria was a hot pick coming into the uh, this U.S. <laughs> Open because of his short game. Everybody felt like you had to have a great short game to play well this week. Which it, yeah, I guess we can we can talk about some of that. Uh, you know, as we, as we preview the U.S. Open next week, like I, I'm not positive that's the case, right? I think it's it's so hard around the greens that it really just puts more emphasis on who hits more greens and who has better accuracy with their irons. I think, right? I mean, uh, we'll get into some of that when I get to 05 as well. Like. There was a very unscientific model of percentages of like what matters just put in USA Today. Like, here's what matters at Pinehurst percentages. Mm -hmm. And I was like, I don't I don't know if that's accurate. I, this is all pre-strokes gain era, right? Of like trying to figure out still working in total putts and all that stuff. I test, uh, baby. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'm not sure how well that was paying off. <laughs> Guys, we have Jack Nicholas is playing in a major again uh, for the first time in a year because he's had his hip replaced. And, you know, Jack has said this quote, I think a thousand times since, but I'm kind of wondering if this might be the origin of it. Listening to guys in the pre-build up to Pinehurst, I used to love listening to him gripe. Somebody would say, the rough is too high, check them off. The greens are too fast, you can check them off. The course is too long, check them off. You can check guys off because they complain about them. They complain themselves right out of the championship. We have to be nearing a threat of this might be, you know, next year might be my last U.S. Open. I'm sure there's one of those quotes in there, right? So next year, he says he's not going to play all four majors for the first time, essentially, in his career. But he is not ready to retire. He says, I don't get a lot of enjoyment out of going out and grabbing three friends and beating around the golf course for $5. I don't get a kick of that at it. The fun of the competition is being in the middle of it. A lot of writing about Jack in this era echoes what we are saying about Tiger these days is like, oh, will he retire? What's he still getting out of that? Oh, he still thinks he can win. Still thinks he can put some things together. Just needs to start get some more reps and stuff. Uh, keep in mind that Jack at this point has a ceramic hip and uh, is 59 years old. So he, and also just to point out, you said he uh, said he wasn't going to play all four majors in the next year. He did play all four majors the next year. <laughs> Jack also famously had a hard time kind of letting go. Uh, I believe he played all the way up to, what, 2005 was his last Open Championship, Sally, I think? Well, he did the retirement tour uh, at, at St. Andrews in 2000, did the wave, and then also came back in 2005 and, yeah, yeah. and played it one more time. So yeah, and he yeah. played the Masters up until 2005 as well. Uh, in one of my favorite things to unearth in this, Earl Woods caused this little controversy leading up to the tournament, giving an interview to Icon, a bi-monthly men's magazine. When asked about Scotland, he said, that's for white people. It has the sorriest weather. People better be happy that the Scots live there instead of Soul Brothers. The game never would have been invented. We wouldn't have been <laughs> stupid enough to go out in that weather and play a silly game and freeze to death. We would have been inside listening to jazz, laughing, drinking, drinking rum. Now, Africa, I went to Africa and I played golf there and I knew I was home. <laughs> Are we allowed uh, to laugh at that? I don't jazz. know if we can. That's I think we can laugh about it because it's Earl. And I think uh, I, there, if there's one wish to Tiger's career that I could make, it is that Earl would have been like healthy enough to have lived another 20 years because Earl was like basically say anything. Earl was freaking hilarious. Uh, just in the way he, I think he said this stuff just to provoke people like half the time. Like he constantly wanted to kind of like dig on people and sort of throw it in their faces and stuff. And a lot of times the sports writers of that era would be like, uh, we're touching this Earl, like tape recorders uh, on, but we're not going to write about this stuff. Cause you hear stories about this every now and then and be like, Oh, we kind of had to protect Earl from himself. He was always kind of you know, he had a couple drinks here and there. He never knew what, like, was, was on the record or off the record. It was in the RV. Yeah, <laughs> exactly. Uh, Earl claimed that these quotes were totally farcical and fabricated. Uh, but then the author revealed that she had taped the interview. And he had <laughs> nothing to say after that. Nobody would have believed Earl on that one. That it was, no. yeah, I did, I did not say that. What was what was this quote, too, about that Tiger was going to have a bigger world impact than Gandhi? Or, or, yes, uh, okay. bigger than Gandhi, bigger than Buddha, bigger than anyone because of his uh, potential Bigger than reach. Nelson Mandela as well? Was that one? I believe so, I, yeah. It's yeah. in the famous Gary Smith story uh, that was when Tiger was named Sportsman of the Year. Uh, it was actually before he won the Masters, if you can believe that. Uh, that they sort of uh, that that you know penned all that. It's worth going back and reading if you can get into SI's. Uh, that was a wild, somewhat cover. shoddy archives. Yes, it was. Dude, like it was him. Like what it was the painted thing. It was like a bluish mm -hmm. cover. I, I, I feel like was it the one? I know the one you're exactly you're talking about. I'm trying to remember if it was like 
one of those ones where it's like a thousand images of tiger yeah. that's like then made yeah. into a larger yeah. image and stuff uh but I, I know it was not like a typical photograph uh but yeah the uh, just the idea that you should people should better be happy that scott's live there instead of soul brothers <laughs> that's incredible so Phil Mickelson, also a pre-tournament favorite, doesn't arrive until Tuesday because he's been at home with his wife, Amy, who's had a difficult pregnancy with their daughter, Amanda. Uh, he says he's going to wear a beeper during the rounds, and if it goes off and Amy's gone into labor, he is going to leave immediately, no matter what position he is in. Uh, doesn't matter if he's leading by four on Sunday on the back nine, he is still going to walk off the course. Absolutely, Phil says when asked if that's really true. That beeper goes off. I'm exactly five hours away. Uh, he and Amy have developed a special code that she can punch into the beeper if she goes into labor in case someone is trying to prank them. Like sort of a lot of writers are making jokes that like maybe Earl Woods might try to put a call into the beeper and get Phil to uh, be bouncing. He said, I'll be very disappointed if she were to go into labor and not call me. How would people get the beeper number? I, this is a great question, TC. I don't know that people, you know, Earl Woods, special ops guy, Green Beret, you never know. Uh, stuff like that could happen. What, what uh, would the cutoff be like? All right. If you are in the middle of 18, the 72nd fairway, like mm -hmm. and the beeper goes you're like you're finishing at that. What, what, would the, what would the cutoff be of like, all right, I can spare a, like a 30 minutes here to do this. Like, it, 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 you know, we can agree if it's an eight yeah, foot putt, he's putt not walking off. Go. Yeah. <laughs> in more County airports right there. You would have First to... child, uh, you know, I don't know. Is Hannah going to listen to this, Sally? I mean, what, what, how truthful do you think you can be? I'm, I'm, I'm the 14th hole. I'd walk in. Like, I'm out of there. Right. 17. Uh, uh, first uh, child. Uh, I don't know. Well, as you'll see, Phil la really labor didn't lasts have... a long time. It can last true. a long time. This is true. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, as you'll see, uh, though, Amy kind of lies to Phil throughout all of this. Uh, she's basically in labor the entire time, uh, which didn't really know until Alan wrote this story. Uh, Amy says when Phil left, it was the most emotional goodbye that we've ever had. He was so determined. He said, I am going to win the U.S. Open. I'm going to come home. We're going to have a baby, and it's going to be the best week of our lives. Phil said, I had no doubt in my mind I was going to win the tournament. Uh, they, Alan got bones and bone, bones. <laughs> I'm going to hit this parlay, too. <laughs> <laughs> bones actually had to carry the beeper. I don't know if you remember that. Uh, and Bones said, oh, God, the beeper. I was stressed about it the whole time. If I would have lost that thing, I've been filing for unemployment. I heard people, plenty of people say after the fact, oh, he wouldn't have left and this and that. But when Phil showed up in Fine, Pinehurst, he got in my grill and said, I don't care where I am. I want to know 10 seconds after that thing goes off. He was dead serious. Uh, Amy said, on Wednesday, my mom took me to see Dr. Webb, who's their uh, OBGYN. He checks me out and he goes, wow, things have changed. If you would have looked like this yesterday, I wouldn't have told your husband to go. And my heart just sank. It had been a difficult pregnancy for Amy. I, this is a, kind of an amazing thing. In late March, Vijay Singh's wife, Ardina, threw a baby shower for Amy Mickelson. Always thought that they were going to, like, the Mickelsons and Singhs were mortal enemies. The following day, Amy had to be taken to the hospital because she started experiencing contractions. She was confined to bed rest from there. And ever since then, like, chirping cell phones and pagers started to make Phil nervous because he always wanted to have the beeper on him around him. I didn't know if I was going to come home, he said. On Friday, Amy started to have contractions. Phil and I were talking all the time on the phone, but I was not saying what was going on, which was really stressful because we share everything. Eh, maybe not everything. So <laughs> we have these contractions, and as soon as he hung up, I burst into tears. A lot of comments uh, in the lead is, up. If I may, this was like, maybe this is just me 25 years later remembering, like this was like the story of the sports the world. Story. Yes. Like uh, not just golf. It was like everybody... Well, I feel like I, I even remember people at church talking about like, is the beeper going to go off? Like mm -hmm. still, even as of Sunday, like that was that captivated the sports audience was like, was Phil going to go? Is Phil's sure. wife going to go? Into yeah. Labor? And Phil's still like this dashing young player and he's wearing Baby the face, visor yeah. and he's Yonix visor TC. Yeah. Mr. Mr. Family man. I mean, this was mm. peak Phil hamming Big, it up, you know, very, very true. Uh, and, and as we saw with the Scheffler stuff, like the remakes are never as good as the originals. Because like that, the the whole Scotty will Scotty leave the tournament thing was not quite as dramatic. She ended up having the baby what three weeks later or something. So this was like actual like touch and go. She was trying very hard to not have the child, uh, not have Amanda while Phil was about to win the tournament. Uh, a lot of comments uh, in the lead up about how hard the course was. This place makes Augusta look tame. Tom Lehman said. Uh, I've been asked many times what the hardest course I've ever played is, Lee Jansen said. Now I have the answer. Pinehurst number two. 
John Cook said, this isn't like any golf we've ever played. If anybody hits 10 greens today, this is, I think he said this on Saturday, uh, it will be five more than anyone else. I played this as a par 88 today, which means I had 12 <laughs> birdies. A birdie is out of the question today unless you're off the green and you can chip it in from the bunker and make, or make a 30-foot putt. You're not going to get it close to anywhere in the, uh, in the fairway. What so, a bunch of pampered fucks, man. Yes, like, very much so. The whole, the whole point of the challenge is that, yeah, you might have to hit a wedge to 30 feet. Like, that's, that's what the challenge is out here. It's not as if, like, guys are shooting 78, 79. You know, it's like, you know, one guy ends up under par and, you know, Phil shoots even par. Or Tiger shoots one over. VG shoots one over. It's like, yo, it wasn't that freaking hard. But they were just, it was so kind of indicative of how different, how raging they would be, like, against, uh, you know, the, the actual change of things. So, but before one of the rounds, John Cook said he overheard Tiger and Payne on the putting green when Tiger said, when I start designing golf courses, I'm going to make them 9,000 yards, and then you old guys won't stand a chance. And Payne starts zinging back at him. Yeah, well, if it's the U.S. Open, you'll still have to drive it in the fairway. And Tiger laughed, but he didn't have an answer for that one. I'm not going to dwell. Also go not ahead. consistent with our, our now found understanding <laughs> of uh, what it takes to win U.S. Opens. 100%. <laughs> the way that golf like intelligence would change about this stuff is uh, is quite funny. But this is a time when they're sort of driving it to 260 or whatever. So, sure. you know, it's... Uh, as we'll see play out. I'm not going to waste too much time on the uh, early read up lean up because the final round is so exciting, but uh, David Duvall is and even with the burnt fingers is, uh, you know, goes out and shoots 67. In the first round tied with Paul Goido, Billy Mayfair and Phil Mickelson. The shot back is, is Tiger Woods, Payne Stewart, John Daly, uh, someone called David Bergonio Jr. Bergonio. Bergonio, yeah. <laughs> That's TC's guy. Yeah. Yeah. You know what, TC, I'm glad you're here to identify some of these guys that I, I've i never heard of. Uh, this is, you know, I didn't get too deep into David Bergonio, uh, but uh, that name. KVV Bergonio was getting all sorts of, uh, He's the he was, dude on, that a just makes one he was start. on a major medical for like 18 years. It was wow. so sick. Like, How like, do you extend your major medical sick. that long? He was the guy that come. He would make one start and then be like, "No, I'm still on. I'm. I got to go back on medical. Like that's like they. It just ended. They they had to rewrite like the entire major medical rules on account of this guy. It it was incredible. So he's collecting like hundreds of thousands of dollars a year in compensation from the tour being on a major medical. What are the rules with the major medical? You get like the average of like the what is 120th or something person on tour like what I, I can't remember exactly what the deal is but do you remember you know what kvv i'm not in the major medical game anymore i used to be tracking that kind of stuff now that they've cleaned it up we kind of flew the banner i forget all the details but i mean hey, you put you on the spot get, like that <laughs> get some sort of you know stipend you know full benefits and all that stuff and yeah just kept making making one start a year so it's finally over disgusting uh, also lurking after a second round 70s, VJ Singh, having won the PGA, uh, you know, a year before this is, is starting to really emerge as one of the top players in the world. Third round scores here, you know, Payne Stewart takes the lead. Payne Stewart, uh, obviously lost the US Open the previous year to Jansen when he shot 74 on the final day, blew a four stroke lead, uh, was sort of devastated by that, really felt had a tremendous, tremendous pride in his national championship would uh, always wear red, white, and blue on the final day. Payne was still, still kind of a divisive figure, but was trending more towards being on this on his softer side. Even his own mother said that uh, he was, you know, he'd improved in the sense that he was no longer rude to people, no longer cursed out uh, autograph seekers and, and made them seem like they had the plague. Uh, very much leaning into embracing his religion at this point. Also, Paul's a Paul Azinger's uh, cancer diagnosis really made pain think about his own mortality and he visited azinger all the time and really azinger said that you know all my friends kind of disappeared but pain was the one guy who was sort of there day in day out so is pain a bryson is, comp here like mm, is it that oh, you're describing this i'm like you know the hat and then all that stuff that's that's interesting i, I never i never thought that i mean it's remarkable how like kind of simplistic pain's swing looks uh these days like just no leg drive at all just kind of like very armsy it's, i mean it, not a kind of swing that you could uh, survive with on the tour today, but drives it super straight, putts with the, like a center shafted putter, just a, a kind of fascinating window into that era of uh, stuff. Obviously he said that, uh, you know, he wore the really kind of goofy clothes today because he wanted to sort of, he was kind of a showman. Maybe there is a Bryson Cup there. So he wanted to stand out, wanted to feel like an entertainer a little bit. 
we're going into the final round here. I, I think this is where the most of the drama ensues. Uh, I really feel like we could spend a little bit longer time on this. Uh, on this Sunday, uh, John Daly records an 11. Uh, if you remember when he whacks his ball while it's still moving. <laughs> I distinctly remember that. Uh, rolling back to his feet. He said, after the round, he said, I just decided to do what Kurt Triplett did last year. Apparently, Kurt had hit his move, ball, moving ball. He said, I'm not going to sit here and waste my time. Uh, in the process, he shot an 83, finishing 29 over the championship, DFL. Remember, John Daly was like a shot off the lead uh, after day one. Uh, I don't even know if I'll play the U.S. Open next year. I don't know if it's worth my time. I'm not going to Pebble, and I'm not going to watch them ruin that course, too. I have had it with the USGA. I've never seen a course play so unfair as it was in the last two days. So after the third round, uh, Payton had not played well. It, it still kind of uh, you know, ended up uh, being in the final group. But his wife, Tracy, had sort of told him, he'd pulled him aside after that night when he walked off the green. She said, I want you to know, honey, that you're moving your head a little bit too much when you're putting. Oh, it was a tip, God about this. tip that she had gotten from his father, Payne's father, like when he was dying. At first, he really did not like Payne's wife, Tracy, who he had met while he was playing the Malaysian tour. They had gotten married. He had basically said, his father had said, you know, he's just going to distract uh, Payne from his, his goal of being a great golfer, uh, you know, but she had slowly kind of warmed him over the years. And when Payne's dad was dying, he wrote her this long list of, she's like, here's the things that I want you to tell Payne, like about his swing, you know, when I'm not around, because he needs someone to sort of pull him back. And one of those things was make sure and keep your head still when you're putting. So she brought this up, uh, after his third round and he was like by god you're right and so like late in the evening that night he pr went and practiced putting just keeping his head still doing the exact same routine every time sunday morning Payne wakes up and nbc is running a piece about his him and his dad who you know has, has passed away five years prior and he just starts bawling like he's he goes into tracy and he says i'm just really emotional this is father's day and i i really want to win this one for my dad saturday night back home in scottsdale Phil calls up Amy, you know, he's a, he's a shot off the lead or I think he's, excuse me, I think he's tied for lead. And she says to, you know, this is to Alan later, my contractions had started coming really fast. So we decided to go to the hospital and Phil happened to call right about then, but I didn't say anything at the hospital. They put me on a monitor and gave me a uh, turbutaline to slow down the contractions. Eventually Dr. Webb comes in and stays with me and I'm asking him every five minutes, should I call Phil? Should I call Phil? He keeps saying, not yet, nah, not yet. This went on for a few hours. Finally, the contraction slowed enough to where he felt comfortable sending me home. So like truly a, like, like, whole, like praying to God every moment that like this baby does not come uh, and, and kind of actively like withholding information from Phil. Like, who knows if Dr. Webb had money on the final review. Here. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to say. So, uh, so the next morning, it's kind of rainy. It's really kind of damp. It's kind of dark. Uh, it's, there's like a mist that's hanging in the air. Payne Stewart shows up in a rain jacket, and he's, it's really bugging him during the, the hitting balls on the range. So he tells his caddy, you know what? Go find me some scissors. The caddy's like, okay. So he runs like into the Pinehurst Clubhouse and does the Belichick thing, cuts off the sleeves Iconic. of his rain jacket. Iconic yeah. image. One of the first like sleeveless rain jackets ever, uh, ever made right there on the range at Pinehurst, uh, chopped off. This, of course, allows Payne to show off his shirt underneath, which is red. So he's wearing the red, white, and blue. Bones, until it's a ship knock later, it's it was like the biggest crowds that I've ever seen in a tournament in the U.S. You would left of 18 green, you would go let like walk past the range to go to that first tee, and you had to walk across 18 fairway pretty close to the green to this day. It's one of the coolest memories of my caddying life came when Phil and Payne were walking to the tee. The whole grandstand stood and cheered. It was like two gladiators going into the Coliseum. I'm so nostalgic about this era. Like, mm -hmm. again, this is like pre cell phone and everybody just filming people. Like, you were just, people were way more present in the moment. And like, mm -hmm. I was so impressionable during this time. Like, that, like, kind of gave me chills of like how, how, you know, how awesome that must have, must have felt. So we have a barn burner of a final round. I mean, it is like it, 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 any one of four guys could have won this U.S. Open. Like if any little different thing goes uh, the other way. Payne birdies the first hole. All right. So he comes out and he's like, "Woo!" like I am. I'm in control. I'm going to, you know, he's he's what was, he's what was he like calm. again? What was it? <laughs> That's that's my best pain impression. Uh, but you know, well, what will be kind of a theme for the day? He hits a terrible chip. Uh, on number two, it has to roll in a seven footer just to make a bogey. 
uh, and he makes a seven footer, but it's just kind of like, man, like he doesn't really seem like he's super sharp. Phil comes out and I'm not kidding. When I say this boys, this might be the best final round of a U.S. open that Phil ever played. Like he was rock solid. Guess how many freaking fairways he missed on this day. Three, one, two, two Whoa. freaking fairways. You know, Phil? Uh, yes. Again, yeah, now cool. he's, he's, his drives are often topping out at 267, 268, but still like it's, this is some clutch shit. Like it's, uh, he is, he's absolutely, and he's, he's putting great. I, you know, it's hard to sort of, I think, describe watching this final round, how much better Phil played than Payne, like T to green, just, just way more in control of his golf ball. Like, you know, not making a ton of putts, but like lagging them to like stone dead to where it's, you know, it's a foot or tap in or whatever. He, he opens with six straight pars and then birdies seven. Uh, they're, they're, Pain leads by one with nine holes to play. This is where VJ starts to emerge as a real contender. Like VJ uh, birdies makes two birdies in the first eleven holes, uh, particularly on, on as David Duvall is like ejecting completely. Tim Tim Heron is playing with uh, the Tiger at this point. He's he's sort of a non-factor, but it's it's going to come down to VJ, Tiger, Payne, or Phil. At thirteen, VJ has a birdie putt to take the lead outright, and. Oh my God, it does the most vicious like horseshoe lip out that I think I've seen hmm. in our recounting of this. I mean, like a full like 360, just you cannot believe how the putt doesn't go down. Payne bogeys 12 and Fick Mickelson now leads by one. Tiger is really, he's lurking. He's three, he's three shots back at this point, but he's coming. You can feel it. Uh, he keeps, uh, Tiger Icarito so many greens in this tournament. I mean, he is just absolutely like driving it great putting it great, chipping it great, but like launching nine irons, like 160 yards over the green. Uh, Johnny Miller says Tiger has every part of his game except for short irons. If he can get that, I think he will lap the field in the second part of his career. But right now that is still really holding him back. This was uh, Tiger's uh, last last U.S. Open pre-solid core ball. That's right, TC. Did he, did he figure the short iron thing out like going just, forward? Or is that a pretty just, nice call from Johnny yeah. Miller? This episode on Pinehurst U.S. Opens is brought to you by the Pinehurst Resort. With the playing of the 2024 U.S. Open, Pinehurst Resorts embarks on its era of serving as an anchor site of the national championship. The U.S. Open is going to return four times in the next couple of decades in 2029, along with another U.S. Women's Open in 2035 and 2041, and again in 2047. For the first time in nearly three decades, Pinehurst opened its first original golf course when unveiled Pinehurst number 10 in the spring of 2024. It was designed by Tom Doak. It's got dramatic elevation changes, natural sandy areas, remnants of an early 20th century sand mining operation. They just continue to invest in their present and their future. They had a three-phase process to renovate the guest rooms in the lobby of the flagship hotel, the Carolina. It finished, they finished that up this past spring. They debuted the new restaurant, the Carolina Vista Lounge, which is, has an expanded cocktail bar, a contemporary menu, unlike any other at Pinehurst, offering guests a stylish and satisfying respite, befitting the setting of the historic Carolina Hotel. Uh, and in between its most recent U.S. Opens, 2014 and 2024, it's been a huge era of evolution for Piners. And that time they opened the, the cradle, the short course. It's been wildly popular in uh, 2017 is when that opened. Gil Hans redesigned Pinehurst 4. It's got consistent praise in Pinehurst Brewing, uh, housed in the original building that served as the village of Pinehurst Steam Plant in 1895, remains as popular as ever among guests and local locals alike. Pinehurst is a fantastic visit. I hope everyone gets a chance to check it out and enjoys the U.S. Open next week. Let's get back to the pod. Honestly, it's so impressive to go back and watch these about how much Johnny was willing to stick his neck out and how like often he was just dead on right about the stuff. I mean, the original there is, KVV, many people are saying. That's right. <laughs> right. There is no like waiting for the ball to hit the ground and then being like, oh, tough shot. Like the ball's in the air and Johnny's like, that's not good. That is that is terrible. And, you know, he's not like, you know, he's sitting in a tower like on 18. Like it's not like he's there seeing it. He is incredibly good at calling like, where the ball is sort of starting and where it's going to end up. His stuff ages so well. And all of yeah, these really lookbacks, like you go like his, his, I remember just his, his voice is like the voice of drama. Like you just mm -hmm. heard that voice. It just felt elevated. He said meaningful things and it just felt like he made everyone else around him that much better. Like he that, just teed people up said, so well. 2014, we'll get there. There's oh, really? <laughs> Past his prime? A, a little bit. I mean, according oh. to you in the tweets. Oh, gosh. Which we were sharing the Twitter account at that point. That might have that could have been any of you. Any of no, you. Guys. Basically, Johnny just kept saying, 
he couldn't get over the fact that Keimer was putting from everywhere. That was me. Yeah, that was a tough call. <laughs> <laughs> I remember that from 2014. So it was like, you know, Keimer with a four footer, and Solly's like, oh, Johnny Miller's shocked. He's he's using a putter for this one. <laughs> <laughs> Keimer had the chipping yips. It was putting everything, yeah. and Johnny kept kept doubting it. Yeah. Keimer's winning by like eighteen shots, and he uh, we'll get there. <laughs> so I, again, it's hard to emphasize like just how different this game was back then. I know that we kind of harp on this a lot, but like a lot of Payne's drives are going two fifty. Like it's it's I know it's wet, but you know Phil's Phil's out driving him, but his drives are never going beyond really like two seventy. Like that is the the max sort of thing tiger's hitting it out you know maybe 280 it's a remarkable display like how hard they seem like they're swinging at the ball but the ball is you know going a reasonable amount this on 14 golf, man yeah this is, is this is sure real go back golf. to like this 1999 is true this is the end of it test. this is yes. the end yeah. of it this is truly the end of it i mean the course was 7100 it's almost 7200 yards mm -hmm. and then like golf got broken from this point forward like this is yes. this is the last time golf like made sense so on 14, Tiger gets a really good shot in there and then makes a 30-footer, drops down to his knee and gives the like the epic fist pump. I mean, Tiger was like super expressive in this. He was it was less kind of like the cold robot. He, he's just like really animated about all kinds of stuff. He's he's to within two of Phil, who leads. But Payne makes a birdie on 13 to tie to tie Mickelson. So it's it's you know, it's it's really like boom, boom, boom. They could let it could be anybody at this point. Again, VJ is one shot out of the lead at this point. And he makes a, a pretty bad drive on 16. The 16 at this point is the longest par four in history of the U.S. Open. So hard. It's 483 yards playing into the wind that day. VJ gets over the ball. The ball's kind of sitting up and he decides, you know what? I'm going to take a rip at this with a fairway wood. And Gary Koch says, like, this could be the tournament. This could win or lose the tournament right here for him. He hits this, like, horrendous smother hook that never gets 20 feet off of the ground, somehow misses the cross bungers and ends up in a really bad spot left of the green, cannot get up and down from there, makes a bogey. That's VJ. That's the kind of the end of VJ's run. Tiger misses the green on 15, but chips with a fairway wood. He'd been kind of doing this all throughout the week. This is the kind of the Randy special, probably maybe where uh, Randy sort of uh, got the idea in the first place. Tiger really doesn't do this ever anymore, but all throughout this week at Pinehurst, he was doing the, the three wood bump chip, which is, Really fun to kind of see. Uh, in, in he makes a par there, still only a shot back. Uh, excuse me, two shots back at this point. Payne misses the green on 14. All right, hits another like indifferent chip. Like, this is the story of like all throughout the day. Just chipping was really kind of sloppy. Like, you know, Phil's chipping even when he missed greens way better. But again, from 12 footer, makes it like Payne is just like making everything. He misses the green again on 15 with another poor iron shot. Phil hits a great shot in the middle of the green. Okay. We're, we're, I'm going to bounce around back and forth because the TV coverage is kind of crazy. This is right at the same time that Tiger just absolutely roasts a drive on 17. Remember, it's 483. And guess what he has left into the green? 17. 16. 16. Excuse me. Yeah. He's got 210 left into the green after just absolutely roasting a drive. Like, this is, you know, he's got a four iron. And this is like, it's so fun to watch him have to think his way through this. All right, like Phil and, and Payne are going to come up and play this hole in a minute and have to hit two irons into this hole. Gary Koch says in the broadcast, players have been hitting this green less than 5% of the time uh, today. Tiger hits a laser to about 12 feet, okay? So we cut back to 15. Phil hits an awesome putt from 25 feet. With a foot to go, it looks like it's going in. For some reason, Johnny yells out, Amy, <laughs> just as the putt <laughs> power lips out. <laughs> I think... I think Johnny thought he was going to make like an iconic call and like, it's never explained. He never goes back to it and was like, oh, that was for you, Amy. But very strange. Johnny says, that was one of the great putts I've ever seen. It deserved to go in. So I know you made this point once about the Pinehurst Cups, and I don't know like if the, it's just a Pinehurst thing or USGA thing, but so many lip outs in this, like just power hard lip outs. I, I looked for what you once talked about where they don't set the cups like as down deep as they did. And so it's like a little harder. It looks like the the white part of the cup is like up a little higher than normal, but uh, I don't know enough about that kind of stuff to sort of make that judgment call. But I, just amazing how many putts get lipped out uh, mm. at this US Open. I need to go. I'm gonna go back and watch that. Oh, Amy, Amy, <laughs> Barbara. I, I watched it like five times to make sure that that's what he says. There's nothing else that he could have could be saying there. It's clearly Amy. Pain Maybe he was waiting for like Amy. Don't call that beeper. <laughs> Amy, hold on. Hold on, honey. Uh, so Payne finally misses a par putt, about an eight-footer, and Phil has the lead by one again. It's the first, the only really important putt that, that uh, Payne will miss all day. He's not playing great. He's just slopping it all over. 
Uh, Tiger on 16, you know, we hit that four iron in there. He makes like makes the putt and makes one of the best like fist pumps that I think you'll ever see. I'm going to put it up on here. This is the sort of preview of it as it's going in. He's pimp stepping it and just an absolute like Muhammad Ali uppercut, like just incredible theater uh, in that moment. Uh, Tim Heron tells Chip later it was football game loud. It would give you chills up and down your spine to hear it. But on 17, Tiger steps up and he hits it left into the bunker. Right now, he's, he's a shot off the lead and he just makes it kind of a, a stinky swing. Miller says, this is one of the easiest shots, bunker shots on the course. That is holable, all right? So we cut back now to both Phil and Payne are in the fairway on 16. Phil has 226 into this green. And Johnny says, isn't this what Donald Ross wanted? This was the ultimate test. You had to play your long irons well. No, uh, I think Donald Ross wanted a 490 hole to be driver wedge. Like, I yeah, think yeah, that's, definitely. That's, that's, that's probably a better test of skill uh, just to be able to launch it 340 down the fairway. Well, you know, he, he just said better athletes, you know, better <laughs> athletes will come along and just kind of, you know, who cares? Phil hits kind of an okay shot, but it ends up sort of short right in some thick rough uh, just short of the green. Payne hits a truly just a garbage shot that should have either ended up in the bunker well short or buried in thick rough. It hits the lip of the like, uh, the bunker front of the fairway and somehow instead of going back into the bunker or like kicking into the rough kicks hard left into the fairway uh, no chance if it doesn't do this that he can get up down and make par but it ends up in the fairway 10 yards short of the green meanwhile up ahead tiger hits a great bunker shot he misses it maybe by like two or three inches from going in the ball goes three feet by we're cutting back now to phil hits kind of a shitty chip if he said later if he had had a one shot back it would be this chip on 17, 16, excuse me. Payne hits maybe the worst chip I think like a professional could make in that moment. Hits it 25 feet past uh, the pin so that he has a downhill double breaker that he needs to make to make par. Uh, essentially, like Azinger says later, like in a documentary about this US Open, like you could easily put this ball off the green. Phil tells Shipnuck in 2014, when he bladed that shot, I didn't really consider him the number one threat anymore. I thought Tiger was the number one threat. Somehow, Payne rolls the ball in. Like, it's just, it's maybe like one of the most iconic, I think, use open putts uh, that you can imagine. It, it, it all gets overshadowed a little by what happens on 18. But, like, he holds this center cut and then just, like, puts his finger up like he's a superhero walking away from an explosion. Just like, yep, got that. Phil says later, like, if that ball doesn't goes in, it probably runs 15 to 20 feet by. It had the potential to go off the green. Phil, of course, then misses his, like, seven-footer, like, pushes it hard. Every so, seven-footer in this time period he missed. Yeah. Every single one that mattered. Yeah, it's truly, like, Phil's a great, great putter. He, he'll Later in his career, he'll be kind of go through a shitty string. But at this point, he's a great putter, except for, like, when it matters. Like, he's and just sprinkle truly... in some, like, four-footers that'll do a full yes. horseshoe. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It, you know, I so saw you're talking about like just remembering this being like that era. Like for the people on the ground too, it was like they knew something like special was happening. Uh, Rick Smith, who's Mickelson's swing coach, said the conditions were so unusual for U.S. Open. It was dark, it was misty. There was almost an eerie feeling. And you know, there's this church across the street in Pinehurst. Seconds after Payne made his putt on 16, the bells start ringing. That was a beautiful sound. It just went out across the course. It felt like some kind of sign. So back to 17, Tiger has to sort of step away after this roar. He hard power lips out of this four footer. Like Azinger says later, it's probably the last time Tiger missed an important putt for an entire decade. No, nope. just <laughs> true. <laughs> total, total made up. Like, that, you know, the, the, I'm ready to the squash this of Tiger. That Tiger never missed these putts. We'll get there as well, but yeah. continue. So 17 T Payne steps up. He has not really hit a great iron shot at all today. Like he has just squirted it around. It's, you know, it's sloppy. He somehow like grit and guts and finding put the ball way to put the ball in the hole. He steps up and just absolutely stripes one. You know, it rolls out to six feet and the crowd is going fucking bonkers. Like it is crazy. Phil's like, hey, good shot. Good shot. Phil steps up and hits it like maybe a foot outside of pain. Like just a ridiculously good thing. Miller's like truly two of the best iron shots that you will ever see in that with that pressure in that moment bones sells ship later when phil's ball hit it that close to get it in the hole that was a smell of the roses moment for me that place went crazy hmm. but we get up to the green and phil is uncertain about the break of the putt 
he says, you know, Bones Swelling later said that Phil said, hey, come over and take a look at this. I thought it was pretty straight, but the putt turned a little right and it missed. In hindsight, it was probably left edge. In my 22 years as a caddy, if I could have one do-over, it would be reading that putt by a million miles. So Johnny doesn't believe that Phil, like, misreads the break. He's like, oh, he pulled it. Second straight hole, <laughs> pulled it. <laughs> it's just sick. Payne pours in his putt, one stroke lead going into 18. So Tiger up ahead, absolutely stripes a drive in the fairway. Uh, he's still got a chance. You know, he can, he makes a birdie here. He can, you know, get into potentially a playoff. He hits it kind of in a different iron shot to about 30 feet. And you can hear as Tiger gets up there, both Phil and Payne drive theirs in the fairway. Tiger's up on the green. You can hear the, the church bells that we're talking about, like on the broadcast. And you hear Gary Koch say, they're playing angels we have heard on high. And Johnny fires back. Well, he's going to need it right here because that cup is pretty high. <laughs> <laughs> I almost want to just like turn my headphones off and just go watch this. Like, yeah, I, yeah. I almost yeah. feel like I was like, I, don't spoil this. I want to go back and watch this. This is Johnny like, rules. This is peak U.S. Open shit, man. I, it's true. Off the top is. of my head, I'm struggling to think of a more iconic U.S. Open in my like, you know, lifetime. I remember watching this. Uh, I was an intern at the Phil, uh, excuse me, at the Great Falls Tribune in Great Falls, Montana, and I was working the sports desk. And we were watching up on the screen, as, and I I remember Tiger's putt being really, really good, but I didn't really remember like how fucking good it was until I watched this replay. I mean, he absolutely reads it like so, so, so good. And it looks like on the broadcast, like it like grazes the edge. It doesn't quite when they show the replay, but Johnny Miller's like. That putt is so pure, it defies description. Uh, but Tiger can't make it, makes a par. It's, you know, probably going to miss out here. Payne hits another shitty drive. He keeps pushing drives to the right all day. He's had to lay up and like get up and down uh, like probably four times throughout the day. So he hits a drive. Uh, Roger Malpe's like, that's great. And Johnny's like, nope, it's not. That's, <laughs> that's going to miss. That's going to be a miss by a one yard. It's totally right. Roger goes over there. Yep, that's the worst lie I've seen all week. It's terrible. So Payne has to hit it to about 75, uh, 78 yards he has after his layup. Phil hits a really pretty good shot, about 18 feet, uh, just kind of right of the pin. You know, he so Payne has got to hit like a, you know, a, a pretty good shot here. And it looks like I would say hits a pretty like kind of meh, like, you know, from 78 yards to leave it, you know, 18 feet or so. I, I don't think it was particularly great like nobody thinks it's great but they're like well he's got a putt everybody on the at this point is kind of expecting like hey we're probably going to get a playoff here and apparently Payne's caddy at the time was like oh shit like we've got this really like expensive like charitable member guest thing that we were supposed to play in on Monday and I don't know like me and Payne and Azinger and you know some other I think Jansen he's like I don't know who I'm going to get I'm, I'm going to know who's going to get to fill in for us like I, I got all this like Investment of the people are going to be so pissed. He's like, I swear to God, that's what I was thinking about on 18th green. <laughs> Phil hits a really, really good putt. Better than I remember. It just misses high. And Payne, of course, like, it's dead quiet. Stands over this putt. It's it's actually really straight. It, I thought it had more break in it, but it is a straight in putt. Pours it right in the middle. Does the iconic, like, fist forward, leg kick back uh, that they eventually make the statue out of it. Goes over to uh, to Phil afterwards, uh, puts him puts his hands on his face and said, you know, good luck with the baby. Uh, you're, you know, there's nothing like being a father. So I, I pulled this up. You and I recreated this picture uh, when we knew that uh, Hannah was pregnant. Uh, so at, at our first trip to Pinehurst. No, we, uh, we we did not know she was, well, this is before she was pregnant. We said we took it for. Oh, that's right. In case day. she ever got in pregnant. Case, yes. In case we got, in case we got there. We, you we were like, we're going to, we're going to start to try to have kids. So uh, let's uh, redo <laughs> this picture. Yes. Uh, yes, they did. I, I don't even need to uh, rewatch to Dick Enberg is on the call. Uh, he makes the putt. Payne Stewart is the 1999 U.S. Open champion. Oh, oh my. my. It go. was just awesome, dude. It was just yep. awesome. It was just iconic, man. Payne says, you're, you're going to be a great father. There's nothing like being a father. I swear to God, this is like very old time sports writer thing, but like all the old tri Great Falls Tribune guys, when Payne like pointed like that, were like, did he say like, take that motherfucker? Like that, that sounds more like Payne Stewart. <laughs> Not what he said at that moment. Uh, Azinger says later, when you talk about the greatest showings of sportsmanship in golf history, you have to say that number one is Nicholas's concession to Tony Jacklin in the Ryder Cup. But right there, Payne would be number two. 
Uh, he could immediately emphasize with Phil Mickelson. Payne knows the agony of defeat. Who knew it more than him? Payne goes over to his wife and he pulls her in close and he says, I did it, love. I held my head still all day, just like you said. Oh. Uh, what a shot at Steve Scott by, uh, by uh, Azinger. Yeah, yeah move your truly. Mark Bad guy. <laughs> you know? A lot of people say that, you know, this in the sort of write-up that uh, I think it's uh, Jaime Diaz does after in Sports Associated said that, you know, Payne's the first person to win uh, U.S. Opens with two different personalities. Uh, that he was a dick the first time when he won uh, at Hazeltine, but he's actually like a, a very generous, gregarious person. Even his mom says he's a different man, a better son. I gave him an attitude adjustment, his mother said. You learned you can't go around and be rude to everyone. Bryce Phil, is totally fucking winning the U.S. Open this year, guys. Like, boy. <laughs> the, the parallels. This is why we do these things, Solly, because the echoes throughout history. Mickelson flies home and gets there at midnight. Amy goes into labor immediately the next morning, right about the time that Phil would have been warming up for a playoff. And Amanda is born that evening. Phil says to ship. That is an underrated part of it. Is yeah. if yeah. Payne misses the putt. Phil's got a WD anyways. Yep. Phil says, uh, you know, here we are 15 years later. He's talking to Shipnuck in 2014. Back when, you know, he had a good relationship with Shipnuck. Uh, <laughs> here we are 15 years later, and I can tell her with all certainty that her birth, this is talking about Amanda, is the most emotional moment of our lives. It's something I would never want to miss, and I'm so glad I was able to be there because it really is one of the greatest experiences in the world. I loved her even before I knew her. Azinger says, I believe it's one of those greatest influences that Payne had was in how helped he helped change Phil as a man. Payne was a great example of a guy who had found perfect balance in his life. Phil has always done the right thing. He's always been the good guy, but golf was everything to him. What happened in Pinehurst bonded them forever, and it set the priorities straight for Phil. For eternity. Of course, that, would... that lasted forever. <laughs> that would never wave, waver. <laughs> Oh, that's iconic. U.S. Open, man. That's that's a really fun one to relive just through just I no, I'm definitely going to go back and watch that one. Hey, not a lot of them. Hey. Seeing <laughs> seeing the trajectory of the balls, too, of like, yes. it's, like it's that kind of dark, mm. moody day, like you said, and there's there's moisture in the air, but there's flyers out of the rough. There's yeah. there's low spinners that rise against the, you know, the pine trees. It's really it's a really aesthetically interesting broadcast to watch really which is. i know there's like studies on this stuff that like when you're in a certain age period like you just assume, those are like the good old days for you always like yeah. you just you know the, the older you get but like it really just just seemed like they were so good at developing drama in this time period right and i'm there was some stuff i found in 05 it was like oh so they're just like skipping golf shots like we would have been in furious now as we as we go to watch it but like it just felt like gary and johnny and like the way they pass things off to each other was just it was just it's probably because it's the voices of my childhood, but it, it yep. just seemed like it was better back then. I don't know how. That is it for 99. We are always looking for ways for you to save money on household products that you need to get through the day. I have never seen a product that uh, is this affordable and will save you this much money as Harry's razors. Uh, they're starter kits. I'm just going to say this off the top. Harry's.com slash NLU. You'll get a five blade razor, a weighted handle, foaming shave gel, and a travel cover for $3, $3 at harrys.com slash NLU. It's a fantastic product. It's got great packaging. It's got a nice strong handle. Just feels like a nice quality material. They got German engineered blades made in their own factory. They stay sharp longer. They got customizable delivery options for scheduled refills as low as $2, half of what you pay for other big brands. Uh, and again, at harrys.com, you will find the $3 offer for a five blade razor, weighted handle, foaming shave gel, and a travel cover. Just $3. They also got great body washes, uh, you know, in scents like Redwood, Wildlands and Stone, uh, extra strength, high quality, amazing smelling deodorant for just $5, hair and grooming products. Check out Harry's. Again, harrys.com slash NLU. Get the starter kit, $3. Let's get back to the pod. We head back to Pinehurst in 2005. Again, we are still on this very green golf course. A lot of grass out at Pinehurst. Uh, just the second U.S. Open at Pinehurst. Course is about the same length as it was in 99, only 50 yards longer. Just worth noting in this time period, the fourth hole played as a par five and the fifth played as a par four, uh, which those two are now inverted. And then the, the fourth is a long four and five has a silly tee box way back. That is uh, that is a par five. That's kind of the only real other than, the, of course, the renovation, the restoration that comes after oh, this. 
five as a par four would be so, so cruel. hard. And the USGA is worried about that's the one green they're the most worried about coming into this week. So a stump to Schwab style. I'm going to go to KBB first and then TC and you can alternate going back and forth. Uh, as soon as you get one wrong, you are out of the game, but we're going to have you name the top 10 in the world going into the 2005 U S open KV gets to go first name the, anyone in the top 10 and you, and then and the game passes on to TC Tiger Woods. That is correct. He is number one in the world. VJ Singh. Uh, he is number two in the world. That is well done. Phil Mickelson. Mickelson is four in the world. That is well done. Five. It's so easy when you're looking Ernie at this. It's so hard when you're doing what you guys are doing. <laughs> yes. Ernie Els is number three. You've got the top four. Gets a little harder from here. 2005. You should get five and six. You should definitely get five and six. You said, okay, we have VJ, Tiger, Phil, Ernie. Correct. Mm -hmm. God, why am I blanking on? I pass. I'm... <laughs> <laughs> He's panicked. I'm thinking I, Duvall's, I did. I, I'm choking. Duvall's, Duvall's done at this point. Duvall's done at that point. I mean, just Podrick? think. Re Podrick is not. Let's say think. Think recent major winners or close calls. So, Adam Scott. Adam Scott is seven. You guys both Sir, lost this game, by the way. Sergio Garcia. Sergio, yeah, Sergio. Is six. Okay. Kenny Perry. Kenny Perry's 10. Wow. Good job, TC. <laughs> There's three more. I, I think you can, you, you should get one of it. You should at least get one of them. Recent close calls. What happened in the 05 Masters? Chris DeMarco. Chris DeMarco is eight in the world. Mike Weir. Mike Weir is not up there. Um, who who has won two of these U.S. Opens in the last four years? Uh, Retief Goosen. Retief Goosen is five. Uh, David Toms was nine. Did not think you guys would okay. get to that one, but um, I was thinking Toms, but I couldn't place if that was like yeah. 02. It's hard. To, it's way harder to do than uh, uh, than you'd think. Of like, if you did 09 right now, I would be. Yeah. I would just be guessing. But man, like, um, I'm the first person to ever pass on the thing. That's that's embarrassing. <laughs> 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 it's really fun to ask that question. I would not want to participate. Uh, eventual champion, which we'll get to, is of course Michael Campbell. He is not the low Campbell in the field. He's the 80th ranked player. He qualified for the event through sectional qualifying in England. The first time they held a sectional qualifier actually in England. Only odds I could find on this one. Um, he was not even given odds prior to it. He was listed as part of the, of the field that was six to one. So it's basically like a bunch of names up there. And then it's like, oh yeah, the rest of the field was in there. And that's where Michael Campbell was in. So he would have been more than 150 to one to win this U.S. Open. When was his big run as like world number one or, or, or world number two or what? Like oh, he, was, he was never... No, no, he, he was, was really, no, no, no. really, or or best player, like best player in the rest of the world. Like he was, he was a it's, savage. For his a while. highest rank was ever was in two thousand one. He was the twelfth ranked player in the world. Oh, okay, so. maybe I'm making that up. But, I <clears> mean, <throat> he was crushing it worldwide, though. So this is a story that the KBV uncovered when we covered the nineteen ninety five majors. But he was the fifty four hole leader at the Open Championship, and he tells this story on um, a Chronicles of, a, of the Open podcast, video podcast episode that's on the Open Championship channel. It's not written anywhere. I was like, I remember the KVV telling the story on here, Googled it, couldn't find it anywhere. He was staying in Dundee during the 1995 Open Championship. He's the leader at 54 holes. It's like an hour away. Traffic is tough. And so IMG like comes to him and says, we can arrange for you to have a chopper over to St. Andrews. We can skip the traffic. Obviously, he's getting there later in the day with the, all the traffic, all the fans getting there. He's the 50 hole leader, remember, at this point. Correct. Dundee we'll, is so far from it, I don't know why he's staying there, but he's like, they said, yeah, we'll get you a chopper. And the chopper shows up 45 minutes late. And he has to, and he like takes the chopper and the chopper drops him off and he's 10 minutes away still from St. Andrews. And he tells the driver something of like, whatever you have to do, get me there. Like, just get me there. And he gets there and he hits like 10 range balls and he's off to the first tee. And like he almost missed his 54 hole, 54 hole lead of the tournament, almost didn't make his tee time. And it's like not written about anywhere. I literally couldn't find anything Michael Campbell helicopter that was uh, ever documented. So that's a story. And that's kind of a story that permeates through a lot of the broadcasts. It's like his close call in 2000, in 1995. Nobody again talking about no uh, the almost helicopter. missed flight. But uh, I think it was years. He, he went years before he was like willing to tell that story. Yeah. Like because he didn't want to throw IMG under the bus and didn't yeah. want to sort of like make it seem but for whatever reason i remember when we did that look back like they for some reason they're talking about oh it's kind of a, an unusual rain session for michael campbell like they just didn't know like what was going on like yeah. no one 
for that broadcast had any clue like what had occurred until he revealed it years later. It's crazy. So uh, leading up into this USGA reputation, it's not it's not great. Like at this point, I mean, we're coming off 2004 at Shinnecock. VJ said, if they do the same thing at Pinehurst, I'd rather not play the golf course that way than go out there and make a fool of myself. Uh, of course, referring to the setup at Shinnecock. Tom Meeks is in charge of the setup. This is his last time doing it. Pretty iffy reputation among players. Of course, they're you know, making the point of, you know, we're trying to identify the best players, not embarrass them, blah, blah, blah. It's in every article leading up to this. But VJ also said to Tom Meeks, if you lose the golf course, you'd better hide. But there's no, there's going to be no place to hide because we're going to find you. <laughs> Hell yeah, VJ getting all Tony Soprano on that ass. VJ that rules. Very threatening. Phil, of course, would say without rain and it doesn't look like we're going to get any. We have potential for 18 holes that could be like number seven at Shinnecock. Very conceivable. But you remember they completely lost uh, the seventh green at Shinnecock. Had to water it in between yeah. groups. And Phil says they could do that on all 18 holes here if they don't handle it properly. So. <laughs> In 2005 to date, VJ has won three times. He won the Sony, won the Houston Open, won Wachovia. Uh, Sergio blew a six-shot lead at the Wachovia. Uh, Tigers won three times. Sully, that's this- on the heels of, of VJ winning, like, what, seven or eight times in 04? I, I think 95 times in 04, yeah, something like yeah. that. Yeah, yeah. It, was, it was absurd. Uh, and he won the 04 PGA, um, just two majors prior to this. So Tigers won three times. He won Buick, Doral, and the Masters. But his game's kind of iffy coming up into this. He missed the cut to Byron Nelson. People are kind of like... What the hell's going on here uh, with Tiger? Phil's won three times. He won the FBR Open in Arizona. He won Pebble, won the Bell South. Sergio wins the week before at the Booz Allen. Fred Funk won the players this year, if you'll remember. But in a pre-tournament article, Retief Goosen was asked about not being recognized. He said, there's times I feel like, yeah, you've won a couple U.S. Opens, and there's not a picture of you anywhere or nothing has been mentioned. I don't know what the guys want me to do. Do they want me to do handstands when I make a putt and all that kind of stuff? Tiger received a text from Annika on the Sunday night prior into the U.S. Open that said nine to nine was, was the text as she just won her ninth major to tie him uh, at the LPGA championship, which is funny to go from 99 to 2005. Tiger was a one time major champion. Now he's nine time major champion, just teeing it up six years later. There's again that graphic of the USA Today that predicts the proper mix for the championship. 30 percent of your score is going to come from scrambling, 25 percent putting, 20 percent greens and regulation. 10% driving accuracy and 15% driving distance. No, no, How expl- that come about? no explanation. The test, baby. <laughs> to get to that, but- Drive for show, puff for dough, solid. All right. <laughs> God, I love to think about some sports writers sitting around, like just eyeballing that shit. Like, hey, it's all about scrambling up. 15% <laughs> driving accuracy. <laughs> TC, a, a fun name in the field, a, a college teammate of Tiger Woods has got in as a first alternate through through qualifying. Can you guess who who that might have been? Not named Nota Begay. Jason Gore. Conrad Ray, the wow. co- the coach at Stanford. But Jason uh, Gore didn't didn't play at Stanford. Did no, I don't, I don't know, know where you're going. I was going to say uh, uh, yeah, Casey coach Martin. Ray. But- uh, Coach huh. Ray qualified for for the U.S. Open, uh, and he played a practice round. I, I believe he played a practice round. There's a picture of them play, in a practice round uh, uh, with Tiger. Come out on Thursday, Tiger. He's in some baggy stuff. It's not great, guys. It's it's kind of a it's a tough Nike phase. It is great. Like looking back, it's like that's sick. It it's. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, it, it. He doesn't look great this this coming week. It's streetwear as golf wear. It's, it's not. It's <laughs> not the best look. There's a lot of articles. Or it's same again. I, I saw the same articles. Re, you know, kind of repeating in a lot of different newspapers. But one that kept repeating was like, a lot of stuff comes out this week of like. You remember the Onion headline that was a, a couple years ago that was like, PGA Tour thinks black golfers that were supposed to follow Tiger should be here by now. Like a. a, a but that that article is out there, like in 2005, of like, really? hey, Tiger's still the only black player on the PGA Tour. Which again, I mean, we're all you know, we're eight years after the Masters win at this point. I, I, I don't know if they're like making the connection like right of, of you know the, the there hasn't still hasn't been that impact. But that was a, a again a, still a storyline reverberating through 2005, which that was uh, I definitely don't remember about that about 2005, but. Another look at Pinehurst at this time. I mean, it's just, it is unrecognizable to what we see today. And I remember, I don't know if this is in any of what you're covering, TC, but Bill Core talking about like the, you know, the decision they had to renovate and, and to remove this stuff and how like it felt like the riskiest thing ever, just like by the truckload, taking away perfectly good turf, perfectly good grass out of a golf course. Like that was the thing back then was like, you needed grass for your golf course. And they just yeah. remove all this. Uh, yeah, there was, I think they took out 31 or 32 acres of grass, according <laughs> wow. to it. And just like 
I think looking back, it's like, oh my God, this was the riskiest thing we could have done. And like, look, looking back, the riskiest thing they could have done is doing nothing. Well, it right? just set the trend, right? I mean, yeah. just look how goofy yeah. this this golf course looks with this thick Bermuda and like the funky mo lines and, and what. If you're listening to the pod, I'm sorry, but you can probably visualize it. But another reason to check out the No Lang Up podcast YouTube channel. So in round one, Olin Brown and Rocco Media shoot 67. They lead at three under par. Olin Brown played his way in by shooting a 59 in qualifying. Oh, um, yeah. Something that is brought up uh, frequently throughout. Retief Goosen, Brant Job, Lee Westwooder at two under, KJ Choi, Luke Donald, Steve Jones, and Phil Mickelson at one under, Tiger VJ, Adam Scott in a group at uh, even par and three. Those back. graphics are sick. They are. Uh, and I love looking back at old, old like Thursday, Friday lead. I'm going to give you the top 10 of every single day because the names that cycle through are just what makes me so happy. But Brant Job up there on the leaderboard. I mean, of course, it's, it's a funky US Open. <laughs> All right, trivia question here. The next day for Friday, Dan Hicks refers to a, a group of people as the Fab Five. I don't ever remember there being a Fab Five uh, in golf mid 2000s, but who who are the Fab Five? I mean, we did the top five. I think in the I world. vaguely remember this. We did the top five in the world, which they are. I don't, again, can you name back the the Fab Five of golf? Is it VJ Tiger, Ernie, Ernie, Bill? Bill. God, I, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be Retief. It is Retief. Retief is it is Retief, the fifth, really? The Fab Five, which, yeah, I, that one didn't stick, I don't think, past this one, but uh, I just found that one as an interesting little time capsule. <laughs> the Ray uh, Jackson of Fab Fives, Retief Goosen. Pinehurst not gonna make fetch happen. <laughs> uh, Pinehurst goes, man. It goes hard on this Friday. Phil goes out in 41. Again, Ooh. what kind of defined this era? This putt from four feet. It doesn't touch the hole, guys. I mean, he shoots... Uh, he missed five putts inside of eight feet. He shoots cutting stance. <laughs> he shoots how low his hands are. <laughs> like is super this the, greed. Is this the Ford, the Ford sponsorship where he's got the f big massive Ford or bearing so, point yeah. logo on and his the, chest? He's, uh, yeah, I, I, he's I don't know. Fat. I don't remember. Yes, I mean it's Yo baby yellow shirts with the, the Ford, blue Ford logo. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> subcutaneous. I do not remember this at all. This is the sickest find that I had. So Tiger um, is putting on the ninth green on Friday, and he uh, has this putt here lined up, and he misses the putt, and he takes his putter. Can you? I don't know if you guys can see this in the Whoa. image. Drags it along the green and makes a two and a half, three and a half foot scuff mark Trench. on the green. He received a reprimand from the USGA. It, the, the footage of this also shows him going back and giving, I cannot describe this, the most token effort you could at repairing this. Like, he walks away, and the green still looks like this, but he, he does, like, a little swipe to repair the scuff marks that he makes on this green. But because he technically made an effort to repair the damage, there was no penalty. God. Um, Wow. Like it was, it was pretty gross. Like it was pretty, it's bad. Like a, a really, really bad scuff mark on the green. And he didn't even properly even He's sending a message to, to the USGA. Kick him off the tour, Doug. God, it was, it was bad. I just, but he got off on that technicality. Although, otherwise he would have been penalized. And again, he just like goes and like makes up. I don't even know if he touches the ground, just this swipe at it. Let's um, get officer Gillis out there. <laughs> <laughs> David Toms uh, takes the lead on Friday. Then he drops five shots in two holes, which will be a theme for what unfolds shortly this coming weekend. Retief Goosen is that dude. Again, he shoots 70 to tie Olin Brown uh, and Jason Gore at two under par. Gore shot a 67. Goosen, of course, coming off winning the 2004 U.S. Open at Shinnecock, the 2001 U.S. Open at Southern Hills. Just chaotic U.S. Opens, both of them. Setups that got pretty wild, and both of them, you just poured in those four, five, six-footers the whole time. Gore, of course, the 118th-ranked player in the world. Jason Gore with his wife, Megan, and eight-month-old son, Jackson. They were driving east on Interstate 40 on Sunday night. Fatigue got the best of them. They stopped at a hotel in Asheville. Megan went out to get some clothes out of her bag at 1.30 in the morning. She discovered the door lock had been destroyed. Her clothing had been stolen, along with the car stereo and a laptop computer. They got their car broken into. However, Gore's clubs went to Pinehurst with his caddy. Mm. His clubs and his shoes were, were spared because they were not in the car, and they made his way all the way there. They had to go shopping for clothes. Gore had the quote. Gore is like the folk hero of this U.S. Open. It's blocky mania. I mean, that's the only description I could come Which, up with. Yeah, Solly, like thinking back on that, 
I remember him being much lower than 117th in the world. Like I thought he was. What did I say? 818th. Oh, 818th. Oh, I thought you said 128. You said 107. Yeah. yeah, I apologize. Take that back. He's a. Yeah, I was like, whoa. That's on me. That's also what kind of system did he have in his? It was a. I think it was a Tahoe or a Suburban. Did did he have like a a couple of subs back there? (laughs) And he's just. (laughs) <laughs> just bumping all over the the mini tours don't don't know exactly uh the answer to that one but you know he has a quote on there it's like i feel bad for the guy that broke it all he got was my underwear like just folk hero stuff i mean he is extremely who's, i think he person. said who's got the last laugh now or whatever they got my yeah. underwear but i got the lead to you so yeah. it. kj Choi and mark hensby are one back can you uh one back of the lead through 36 holes can you guess how many fairways mark hensby hit through the first two rounds out of 28 23 tc i said five to start out with i'll say 25 six you were very, you were very close to <laughs> the beginning at six fairways tc gets two choices and gets to the difference so no, fair. i was on the he said five and i thought solly was like he changed oh, i'm gonna it. let you retake that because it was so because it was so egregiously low six fairways that he's won back uh michael campbell sergio vj and lee westwood are at even just two back tiger furick brant job rocco immediate adam scott stephen allen kaichiro fukabori i had not heard that name before yes potential manipulator <laughs> t10 uh but just three shots back so pretty bunch leaderboard going into what's going to be a chaotic weekend somebody f- uh, you're not gonna guess this Corey pavin flew home on thursday night to san diego for his high school son's graduation in between round one and two took a pj then took a red eye back uh, and made it back in time to play Friday. I don't know why this always keeps happening around the Pinehurst stuff, but yeah. uh, flew flew home for his son's graduation uh, there at the 2005 U.S. Open. High schools need to get together and push their graduation either forward or back because it's it's happening too much around the, the majors. Around these golf frankly. tournaments, exactly right. <laughs> Uh, Saturday, we get there are nine players uh, under par after round one. There's only five after round two. And after round three, we're going to end the day with only one guy under par at Pinehurst number two. Tiger hits 16 greens, but cannot buy a bucket. Uh, he finally mm. makes one on 11, does a very dramatic, like, <laughs> finally, things fall. <laughs> finally made a putt, guys. Reach up to the sky, and then he does the, you know, the finger lick and the add one to the tally uh, in there, <laughs> sarcastic, as he pours it his, his uh, first birdie of the day. This is when God, Tiger's, so like, young crazy so... yoked, yeah. still young. He looks like he kind of has a bad attitude. Yeah. Oh, very stinky oh, attitude. Yeah. 100%. Yeah. You, on this, you were very much in this era, like either totally turned off by Tiger's like bitching and moaning, or you were all in on it because you were like, I don't give a shit. He's like the, the dominant dude. Uh, I love it. And I was more in the turned off camp. I got to. Wow. You respected his career. But you just, <laughs> That's exactly. <laughs> Get back on defense, dude. Yeah, exactly. Uh, Retief Goose is going to fire a one under par 69, a steely one, just very much just like the Retief. All right, he's going to do this at every U.S. Open. Like, you're the Brooks Kepka of this. Like, you you do this mm-hmm. at majors now. Got a three-shot lead at three under par. Birdied three of his last five holes. Olin Brown and Jason Gorat even in a tie for second. Michael Campbell and Mark Hensby are plus one, four shots back. Michael Campbell dramatically hold a bunker shot for birdie on 17. But, again, he's four back going into uh, the next day. David Tom's at two over. KJ Choi, Peter Hedblom. One of your Swedes, TC, Lee Westwood, and Tiger all at plus three. So, again, Tiger's six back. Eugene, Our friends at the Eugene Register Guard, of course, uh, KVV said, the biggest surprise continues to be Gore, a sectional qualifier with a substantial midsection. Hell yeah. <laughs> uh, if, Gore, if, you're a husk, if you're a Husky boy, there's just it's open season on your ass when it comes a to sports A midsectional writers, qualifier. Yeah. Gore uh, enjoys telling the story that this is uh, he he held the lead at one point on this day, but he he once he is not his first time holding the lead at the U.S. Open. He once held the lead at the 1998 U.S. Open uh, only because he was in the first group and he held a wedge. Uh, but he <laughs> he loved telling that story of uh, you know that's how my uh, the Thursday started the 98 U.S. Open. Uh, he held the, the outright lead briefly when Goosen made double on 13. It lasted for six minutes as he would then flip over and double uh, the 14th hole. And uh, on the last green, uh, Jason Gore closed with a birdie and walked it in and did the tiger point. Uh, and oh. Go, oh. Gore would go on to say, I said to my caddy, did I just point that ball in the hole? Gosh, I'm a cheese ball. And uh, <laughs> yes. all the headlines going into Sunday, it was like cheese ball steals the show at U.S. Open uh, and things like that. So Gore, 
sustainability models might have been able to identify what was coming because Gore hit five fairways on this day. Uh, Olin Brown would walk off the course saying this course is like facing Mike Tyson when he was 20 years old. The pin on three was dicey on this day. Like there's a lot of shots that come into three in the back kind of center of it that were like everyone was making a mess of that of that third hole. David Toms hits a hits a hits a bird. There's a bird like parked on the green. It, it has a ball roll up and hit a bird on 18 and stop. The bird uh, was backstopping TC. Yeah. <laughs> Outrageous. Well, and there's another ball right next to the it was hole from as fairway. well. So he was, was clearly backstopping. Of course. Anyway. Of course. So we go into Sunday. Goose in his leading, and it's all about the goose. He's got a three shot lead. He's won two of the last four U.S. Opens. If you would have said right then that morning that Rateef Goosen's not even ever going to finish in the top five again at a U.S. Open, that would have been laughed at. That would have been the craziest possible thing you could have said, including that week. He's not going to finish in the top five. You know, <laughs> honestly, a truly underrated collapse, uh, or like final round, like bed shitting by a a somewhat like great player hundred like percent and it was third u.s open yeah and you know again the gore thing gore is just you know laughing it up with the crowd like he's extremely popular dan hicks hits us with in the in the highlight film of a quote that just says it, it it's how you play the game that matters most just based on all of his fan interactions so <laughs> that was a that was a little bit misplaced but so Tiger's opening putt on the first green. And again, Tiger's six off, off the pace at this point. He's putting from just off the green on one, uh, trying to lag it up. It does not reach the green. It gets rejected and comes all the way back at him. Uh, he makes bogey on the first. He also bogeyed the second hole. He's eight back walking up the third fairway. Tiger Woods would be one back walking off the 11th green. This is classic U.S. Open of like, if you are one under par on the day, you are catapulting up the leaderboard like there's so much shit happening there's so much volatility possibilities there's leaderboard gravity like it's a it's a very real u.s open michael campbell comes out birdies the opening hole to get back to even he's still three back of goose and olin brown ejection number one of the day he bur he bogeys five of the first six holes on his way to shooting a plus 10 80 goose and pars the opener but then he skulls a chip and doubles the second Misses a shorty and makes bogey on the third. He's back to even, and now it's a wide open tournament. Gore makes bogey on two, doubles the third hole, and uh, Neil. Neil, we actually covered this tournament on the Greatest Collapses Pod. Neil d deep dove into this one, and I couldn't find the actual quote on this, but it's honestly one of my favorite like laughing moments ever on the NLU Pod. Was uh, Gore started said he's panicked a little bit. This is I'm paraphrasing because I couldn't find the quote, and I'm quoting Neil on this one. But uh, <laughs> after the three over start, he said. Uh, you know, now I got to go get it, which we followed up with the music from the Ghana Paul Bearers, uh, the, the dancing meme of, yeah, you're going to go get it at the at the 2005 U.S. Open at Pioneers. It's not going to go very well. So, yeah, he's plus three. He's playing with Goosen right there, but he, bur he birdies five. And, it, you know, but he's still it. like he's in second walking off the seventh green. He's in second place and he's one shot back with 11 holes to play. What place do you think Jason Gore finished? 11 holes to play. He's one back in second like place. 35th or 40th. No, not that bad. I would say 18th or something. T49. <laughs> Holy shit. <laughs> it, it was one of the worst back nines like in history. He I mean, bogeys eight and doubles nine. He went out in 40, bogeyed 10, tripled 12, bogeyed 14, 15, 16, and doubled 18. He shot 84. I remember he and I don't know if you have this in Zalia. I'm sorry, but, it, but that he and Goosen make a, like a, a wager over the, like the final four holes. So, okay, I won't. They I won't, do make uh, a five dollar bet on that. Um, Goosen like, goes we got or something. <laughs> yeah, Goosen bogeys five. Campbell's now in the lead. Goosen also bogeys six. There's still and NBC starts missing shots at this point on eight. Roger tells us Goosen's hit a flyer over the green, which I I could I would have liked to have seen that. Like we're witnessing one of the all time collapses. Plus five through six, he he shoots 40 on the front and proceeds to bogey 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, and shoots 80. Uh, he His best ever finish again in the U.S. Open would be a T10 years later, but would never seriously contend for a U.S. Open again uh, when it looked like he was going to win three out of five. Damn. Meanwhile, Tiger birdies the fourth and the seventh to pull within three. He's got his charge going. There's this wild image as he's hitting his shot into 11. There's a weather warning. 
Uh, that, and all the fans are removed from the bleachers. So he's hitting the shot uh, into 11. There's still a crowd around there, but it's just a weird image <laughs> with no fans in the bleachers wow. right behind the green. And uh, he steps up and he absolutely stuffs it in there to, to, to five feet right of the pin, makes the birdie, walks off the green, and he's, he's one back. Those bleachers are sweet, like yeah. like how steep they are, mm-hmm. and how on top of the action you are. 100%. Campbell birdies the 10th hole. He's got a two-shot lead now. Then he makes a bomb birdie on 12 to open up a three-shot lead. When he gets to 14, there's a huge roar as he's getting ready to hit a shot, and it's Tiger who had stuffed one to five feet on 15. You know, Campbell backs off, steps up, and fires a laser right at the stick. Uh, Tiger makes birdie. Campbell misses. The lead is still two. Tiger's got an eight-foot par putt on the 16th hole. Missed it. Again, mm. we have to kill the narrative that Tiger never missed putts that mattered. Like he has a chance here again at Pinehurst, and the putter betrays him. He three putts the 17th as well, missing a six foot par saver. So Campbell makes a great up and down on 15. Up ahead, there's a massive cheer. Tiger makes birdie on the 18th green, cut the lead back to two. But again, the two missed putts on uh, on 16 and 17 are the difference as of right now. Campbell steps up on 17 and hits a great shot to 20 feet and pours in the putt. Just dead center. Three-shot lead heading to the last hole. He bogeys 18, but he wins by two. He actually missed a really short putt on 18. Tiger was standing back behind 18 green. I don't really, I'm not really sure why. Trying to intimidate him, I guess, into making pulling a Vandeveld. Uh, I'm not really sure, but his speech is awesome. Like it's just genuine, just like he had been through uh, years of injuries and just uh, you know, unfulfilled potential and kind of the heartbreak from 1995 open championship he shouts out his family in england and new zealand hits his dad with the happy father's day um uh, you know back in new zealand and it's just like it, it it's really good really good genuine moment and again it's like just the the emotions that come from a from a big golf tournament like that were a big reason why i'm a golf fan today and uh it, it's just really good so gil morgan was the last 54 hole leader to shoot in the 80s he shot 81 at the 1992 u.s open at pebble doctor Dr. Gilmore Campbell would say afterwards, I kept telling myself 20 times a whole, keep my focus, keep my focus, keep my focus. And again, Goosen and Gore were so bad. They ended up having a $5 bet in the round between the two of them, which Goosen won. Goosen had 36 putts. They were put on the clock on the 11th hole, not because they were playing slow, but Goosen said, quote, because we just had to hit so many shots. <laughs> <laughs> Basically, the last seven holes, I was just trying to finish the round. There was nothing to play for. This was the That's wild time. to think about him having 36 putts when the at Shinnecock he had like 20 putts or something totally. that final round like it was one of the most ridiculous putting performances ever. And yeah, he I mean it just Pinehurst chewed him up and spit him out on that day. He only finished in a tie for 11th. But uh, this was the first time nobody broke par at the U.S. Open since Olympic in 98. Steve Williams would call it the greatest sports moment in New Zealand history. And he stuck around and gave Campbell a big hug uh, when he came off the 18th green um, as well. This is from Alan Shipnick's write-up in uh, Sports Illustrated. Uh, it's in the bathroom shortly after Campbell went in to gather himself and ran into Tiger. Tiger said, congrats, man. That was some great golf today. You deserve to win. At this, Campbell finally let his guard down. He said, I have one question for you. How do you do this so often? And Tiger said, luck, and smiled as he breezed uh, and walked his, out the door. And Prime Minister Helen Clark uh, phoned Michael Campbell to, to offer his congratulations. And then, uh, again, from Sports Illustrated, the most heart-wrenching moment of Campbell's Father's Day victory came when he called Julie from the quiet in the locker room. Upon hearing her voice, he was so overcome he couldn't speak, gasping for air. Mm. The, 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 the pending father getting ready for his first Father's Day, feeling a little emotional this one. He's like, he finally asked, are the boys watching uh, about his sons, about Let his two the sons? boys and it, watch. And it was uh, uh, after midnight in England, which just like the, the first place he went was like, you know, he wanted to he wanted to do this for for his uh for his son and we just uh, just published an interview with steven yeager steven said something very similar about like i want to win like when my kid can remember what this happening i just found that perspective be really interesting especially on father's day this is what's gonna happen for you at the gasparilla someday sally it's like when all your kids are there to so, see you, you know? so so soon uh told that they were campbell buried his head in his hands and let the tears pour for 10 seconds or more he wept into the phone Finally, he choked out six words. I can't believe I've done it. Hell yeah. It's great. Other 2005 stuff on this day. Only six cars, TC, started the F1 race at the U.S. Grand Prix after safety concerns. 14 cars ducked off the track uh, in protest. Also, Eric Gagne is getting ready to hit the IL, uh, the DL yeah. back then, um, probably for something steroid related. So, uh, One thing that it. wasn't mentioned was just, just Campbell's shirt. He had kind of the Maori 
pattern going on in the shirt. And I just remember being extremely, you know, kind of avant-garde and, and different from anything we'd seen. And then lastly, here is that graphic of uh, of that of that random numbers of what they came up with of scrambling and driving accuracy, driving distance. So, yeah, I love I how this is like not attributed to anything. It's just <laughs> USA Today <laughs> research. And it explains scrambling. Oh, God, that is like, it. I, that is it for 05. It's uh, I, you know one thing I just to sort of generally comment is like it it this sort of kind of set that trend for like the only guys who really stood up to Tiger and majors were kind of guys who were nobody's yeah. uh, in a lot of ways like none of the the great people of tiger's generation yeah. uh stood up and and beat him maybe it was like they felt like they had a free role right and maybe yeah, with nothing, nothing to lose, to lose. Yeah. yeah i guess it depends on what you consider on hell uh because he beat him at oakmont kind of going head to head and that was another like episode of tiger the, the the myth that tiger never missed important putts uh if you ever want to watch one that just like deflates at oakmont is a good one too yeah. He's still like the great. I mean, he's still, we're not denying any of his achievements, oh, right? It's just that like literally nobody didn't miss putts. Nicholas missed putts. Yeah. Like it, it happened a lot. So, yeah. all right, you guys ready for, for 2014? Ready. Gosh, am I ever TC. I'm very excited to welcome you into the deep dives. <laughs> yeah. We did not scheduled out, right. That you got to sit out your first deep dive and wait an hour and a half to get into it. <laughs> oh, okay. No, no. So 2014, let me take you guys there a little bit with, other stuff that's going on in the golf world mm, right mm, please do. uh yeah so i'm gonna i'm gonna add this is oh gosh got, we got nlu we, content we've got no laying up.com hell yeah there we got solly getting off getting off some chris berman jokes and how espn shows a lot of golf shots and golf channel nbc and cbs all love to show pre-shot routines both shot reactions attempt to tell a story with every shot espn strategy seems to be to cram as many golf shots as possible in their time. So also I love that random nugget from you too, Solid from 1999 when Payne Stewart wins. If you look at the scorecard, Phil Mickelson, like there's, there's like a, That's you know, right. He uh, it looks like he's angry or frustrated, right? Like it's he in writes bold. the two on 17 in like bold. It's like really, really dark. Yeah. I totally forgot about that. No laying up. <laughs> Dot Hell com yeah. is <laughs> we've got a pre-order for for t-shirts who is in this on. picture here what, i want to know who are the models behind this i no idea i think it's neil and an ex-girlfriend uh, <laughs> i'm pretty sure <laughs> yeah so that's uh you know that's percolating here oh, we've gosh. got so we're 15 years on from Payne stewart's death and ricky fowler comes out and does a, a tribute to him wearing wearing the plus fours and everything. You know, obviously he's Puma head to toe. He's got the massive Puma cap on, and all of that. But that was uh, that was very very fitting there. I thought it was a good tribute. So, big Ricky era, big big oh, Ricky era, yeah. massive massive. So 2014, what else is going on? We've got uh, Patrick Reed has declared himself a top five player in the world. Uh, after his win at the WGC Cadillac Championship at Doral. We'll get to Doral in a bit here. Uh, Jimmy, Big Tech's Jimmy Walker is just cleaning up. He won the Fries.com opener to, as, the, as the season opener. Uh, he, he won in, in Hawaii. Uh, Zach Johnson won the Tournament of Champions. We've got just, it, it kinda, it's kind of a similar crew to what we have going on now. Adam Scott is the number one player in the world at this moment. It was a little dark in this in this time period. Right? I mean, I, the, like Sunil No was always like up around Sun there. Sunil No, yep. uh, he had won at the, the Zurich Classic of New Orleans a yep. few weeks prior. Bubba had won his second Masters. Yeah. Uh, Stephen Bowditch won the Texas Open. Matt Every won the Arnold Palmer Invitational. Jason Day is playing well. Kevin Stadler won the West the uh, Waste Management. We'll get to him in a bit as well. Players Championship. So players was. Back in May at this point, Martin Keimer wins the Players' Championship. So some some foreshadowing there. Martin Keimer but, wins the Players' Championship. And we were making picks in all of our weekly preview columns. And he had a, a three good rounds and a bad Sunday round yes. at the weekend before. I don't know if it was Wells Fargo, whatever it was. And he was 80-1 to 1 to win the Players. And I was like, guys, we should put Martin Keimer in our picks. We could put, I remember fighting about this, fighting tooth and nail. <laughs> And TC would not let me include Keimer in our picks <laughs> for the week. And I, I, I was Bovada betting, I think back then. And I put $10 on Keimer to win at the players at 80 to one. 
and he won. And I went, I went ape shit. I was, I was <laughs> rubbing it in everybody's face. I told you we should fucking put him in the picks. <laughs> and I won 800 bucks <laughs> off of it. I, uh, yeah. I remember that distinctly. So leading in, we've got Adam Scott won colonial Hideki wins his first career PGA tour victory at the Sally's beloved Muirfield village. And then Ben crane wins the week prior at the FedEx St. Jude classic. So we're going to Pinehurst. Also, big Ben Crane era, right about yeah. this oh, time. Bad. Yeah, that was his fifth career, fifth career win, which is astonishing. Wild. So we're going into Pinehurst. It's they're stretching it out. It's seventy five hundred and sixty two yards. It's about three hundred and fifty yards longer than than two thousand four. They took out dozens of acres of turf. Much different test of golf than it was prior. Both, like Sally, you were saying. You know, 16. How long is six? It was 480, 485. 16's playing 520, 525. And, you know, and, get, and it's not even quite as challenging. It's so, playing shorter, right? Probably. Exactly. Right. Yeah. Exactly. So, you know, we're getting there. There's all sorts of conjecture about the golf course, about, hey, what, you know, this trend in architecture, what have Core and Crenshaw done here? So, uh, let me oh god <laughs> i totally forgot it's brown that's right it's brown <laughs> it's brown and there are uh there, let me see some haters one. out there don't like it so much there, yeah. there are some haters out there here we go we've got dt <laughs> chiming in he said i bet the horrible look of pinehurst translates into poor tv ratings this is not what golf is about exclamation point Johnny Miller, correctly, very critical of Greens at Pinehurst, said they should be redone in a in a reply to Matt Janella. He said, it's true, Matt. The new blue monster is better than Pinehurst. So is Bedminster, Turnberry, and Trump, Aberdeen. Blow it away. So, uh, and then he said, Turnberry in Scotland is a far superior golf course to Pinehurst. And it isn't even close. Likewise, the blue monster at Doral. So, uh you know, kind was of kind a... of fun in this era on twitter you know <laughs> oh he's just mixing it up it's i would great. love it if dt had just stayed part of golf twitter it would have been so sweet I, uh, if yeah. i remember right there's also one where he like took a photo of a tv like we all do and like of how brown it was and, and tweeted about how bad everything looked on tv like it's just the best yeah so this is if you'll remember this is the last year that nbc has the us open the following right. year, it goes to Chambers Bay and Fox takes over and everything. And, and so it's kind of Johnny's send off and ESPN's still doing it. And Chris Berman is in the booth and Whoop. Solly and Randy and I are just lighting Chris Berman up. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> every day, just Twitter. So we'll get there. We'll get there. But <laughs> going in, there's no special exemptions into this one. NLU friend of the program, Will Grimmer, is in the field through the Springfield sectional. He ends up making like five birdies in one of his rounds. Brian Stewart, of course, got through the Springfield sectional, as he always does. Scott Langley earned entry as an alternate. It would be his last entry into the U.S. Open, and, and you know, now he's you see, a USGA uh, stalwart. And he's a, he never emceed there either. You know, I think he played in four or five of them, never emceed. 2005 champ Michael Campbell does not enter, citing a tendon in his left ankle and current form. Uh, sadly, he's, he's also getting divorced at this time from Julie's wife as well. So going, going through some personal stuff, Brooks Kepka qualifies through the sectional at Walton Heath. Uh, mm -hmm. that'll be a theme of the tweets that we'll, we'll, we'll throw up on the screen where when Sally is shouting at the top of his lungs, this guy is going to be really good. This guy is going to be really good. <laughs> Cat pinched a nerve in his back. He had surgery after an uneven spring. He emceed at Tory. I think he played well at, at, at Honda. Noda's giving all sorts of updates at this point on you know what Tiger's got going on. May 30th, 2014, the Wall Street Journal reports that the FBI and the SEC are investigating one Phil Mickelson for insider trading. So he's got a lot going on, you know, <laughs> similar to he had a lot going on in 99. Got a lot going on just in a different way 15 years later. He was wearing a beeper in 99. He's wearing an ankle bracelet in, in 2014. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Bones, uh, let me know if the cops are calling in the <laughs> second you hear it. I want an early head start. Yeah. I'm going to a place with a non-extradition treaty, right? <laughs> uh, You'd be there in five hours. <laughs> Dustin Johnson had withdrawn from the Houston Open to go play in, uh, I believe, the Natsters at Cuscawilla. A tournament put on by Nat Hardwick, who who I think is still in 
federal prison. <laughs> oh uh, God about the Nats. Yeah. The all right. So we get into it. There's a pairings fiasco. The USGA oh, no, pairs that's this year. <laughs> yeah. Uh, this is this is courtesy of the Irish Times. To be honest, I am also annoyed about something. That uh, I don't mind saying it, but I think it is a bit cheeky of the USGA in making the draw the way they did. I'm with Brendan DeYoung and Kevin Stadler for the first two rounds. Someone's bright idea. Put the three big guys together. I think it's unfair to the three of us. It is definitely not drawn out of the hat. That's for sure. And I just hope we don't get stick from the galleries. What they did is making a mockery of the three of us. I spoke to GMAC and he thinks I should say something to the USGA about it. Is this Shane Lowry? Quote? Shane Lowry. Shane yeah. Lowry. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, Brendan DeYoung actually gets off to a really, really good start. Um, you know, and DeYoung made a shit ton of birdies, man. <laughs> that, that dude could fill up the cup. Yeah. He's, uh, you know, from Zimbabwe originally, but lives lives in North Carolina. So he's kind of got local support and everything as well. He's also wearing all sorts of white pants, uh, which, you know, very Tough aggressive. for a big guy. Tough for a big guy to wear white pants. As <laughs> in the I know. summer. I've... In June. <laughs> Uh, there should be some sort of NLU punishment someday where I got to play around in white pants because it is not a good look for me. <laughs> I mean, it's I put them on in a golf galaxy once. I was like, oh, no, <laughs> not it. Not, not it. So tournament's off and going. And Solly is already just chirping, chirping, chirping. Chris Berman. What? Going to take a mammoth effort out on the course to best Berman short sleeve dress shirt tie combo is the best thing I see today. Hey, Finchy, the American leading the United States Open had to play on the European tour this year because of the new qualifying system. Loved the I, I, I love the look back of like, like that first, the, the top tweet there does not sound like me. Like that, that one could be you. That yeah, could maybe be you. that was me or Randy, right? Yeah. I haven't finished breakfast and Berman is already screwing things up. Referred to the shape of the greens as inverted mushrooms. Buckle up. That sounds uh, like you, TC. <laughs> next, next up, we've got Jimmy Walker has three wins on this young season. Berman, as, as he announces the 31st tournament of the year. <laughs> that was me. <laughs> that sounds like me. Sally is, this dates it, right? Must have been a mistake in my channel, guide, as it says that the U.S. Open has been on for an hour, but I've seen about five shots. This is this is a couple days later, but this is TiVo. TiVo, You're yeah. You're showing your TiVo guide yep. and everything here, yep. which I That's thought me. was great. I love uh, TiVo. I wish TiVo had stuck around. TiVo, TiVo was great. sick. And then here's one. You've got the dream team right here, yet we get hours of Berman, and it's a picture of Azinger and Van Pelt. Uh, they were a great you know. duo together. This was before Azinger was maybe not the best announcer. He was a great announcer back then. Yeah. They were. So, um, yeah, so getting into round one, Keimer goes out, shoots – Shoots 65. It's really dry out there. There's, you know, it's, it's a much different presentation, dusty, uh, just all sorts of brown, tan, you know, kind of looked like the tanimal out there. Uh, you got Keimer, 65 after round one. He's putting from everywhere, putting from way off the greens. Leads by three over Brendan DeYoung, GMAC, Kevin Na. And do you guys remember who kind of the Cinderella story was this week? Cinderella story 20 older guy teen older Terry Kelly he so you guys aren't gonna get it Fran Quinn okay literally uh, that's the first time hearing of this person <laughs> here's here's Fran Quinn and his son on Sunday they did a whole Father's Day montage they actually showed uh Jimmy and Zach Blair you know a few others but Fran Quinn is kind of the darling of this tournament he's wearing Playing his speed first... outfit all under armor. exactly he kind of looks like speed right <laughs> playing in his first U.S. Open since 1996 49 years old of course Quinn won the 1989 Mass Am and he won a smattering of nationwide tour events plus the Thailand Open which I really really give a lot of credence to so uh, Keimer birdied four of his first nine and just didn't really look back. And then there's a stalwart group at minus one. Keegan, Harris English, Dustin, Kucher, Hideki, Francesco Molinari, Sned, Spieth, Stenson, and Brendan Todd. The scoring average was 73.23. So three shots over par, basically. Mickelson shot even. But so so that kind of throws Keimer's 65 into pretty stark contrast of like, it's a good round. Which it right. gets remembered for being a snoozer of a tournament, but it's like just a fucking iconic performance. It was an incredible yeah. performance. And totally. uh, it, you know, that unfortunately, like people like drama. We all like drama. And 
you can almost like convince yourself Pinehurst is not a good venue for that because it didn't provide any drama, but like you can't do anything if one guy goes and has a great tournament. That was my thing. Just looking back at this is like, I didn't have great memories of it. It makes me more excited for this, this year's tournament because the presentation is awesome. The course looks awesome. The, you know, I think they're, it sounds like they're trying to keep the greens a little bit shaggier around in certain spots. So you can't necessarily put it from everywhere. You have to chip it. But they got an inch of rain overnight between Thursday and Friday, which it sounds like the next few weeks here this year are going to be similar. Like it's going to be pretty, pretty wet there, unfortunately. But Keimer just basically just goes right back out and keeps up, keeps doing what he's doing. Shoots another 65. He birdies. Uh, he's, I think he started on 10 that day. Birdies 10 and 12. And then he drives the third green, which... Uh, you know, I've played the third hole a lot. I don't see that. No. There, right? <laughs> uh, he, he sets the U.S. Open record at 130. So 65, 65. And if you combine his back nine on Thursday and Friday, he, he, he shot 63 on the back nine mm. with, you know, holes like 16 out there that are freaking hard. So more guys under par. There's 21 guys under par in round two, 13 under par for the tournament at the halfway point. Only one amateur makes the cut. Matt, Matt Fitzpatrick scoring average slightly better on, on Friday. They bumped the tee up at three. So that was why he drove it. But still that's like, that's something I hope they do this year. Bump the tee up on three or even on 13, mm -hmm. right? Rory shoots uh, 68. He's, he's minus one at the, at, at, at the midway point. Kevin Na has this to say, I heard that, Martin Keimer played the number three course. Is that true? <laughs> Not said after a solid 69, put him seven shots behind. It's unbelievable what he's done. Is four or five under out there? Yes. 10 under out there? No, I don't think so. I guess it was out there for him. I watched some of the shots he hit, some of the putts he's made, and he looks flawless. That was from Bob Herrig on ESPN. KVV, what were you doing this week? So this was, I was just starting to get back into golf. Uh, I had been covering football for ESPN for several years and no one at the magazine was really into writing about golf. Uh, and so I was kind of like, Hey, I think we should write like a Phil Mickelson, like big deep dive feature. And his was like, okay, like, you know, if you can get him to participate in it, you know, the last era of Phil Mickelson, right. The he'll definitely not going to win another major, you know, he's 40 or whatever at this point. And so they were like, go to the U S open. Like uh, you can, you know, if you just follow him around, try to, you know, get him to talk. And so basically I, I went there and I was, I basically tailed Phil. I did what I did with Victor this year it was like tailed Phil for four rounds. And I ended up getting all kinds of really good stuff that I, I did use eventually in like a column about Phil the following year, but I, he wouldn't like Steve Loy was like, yeah, no, he's not going to do anything. He's just not interested in, in looking back. I remember Steve was like, He's like a shark, Kevin. He just always moves forward. He doesn't, he can't go backward and look backwards. <laughs> yeah. and, uh, my other funny story is I was having dinner in Pinehurst. You know, it's that little village and everybody's kind of eating at the same restaurants and it's all, you know, you can kind of bump into people. And I was sitting at like a sushi restaurant uh, and having like a kind of a spirited debate with some of my colleagues about Rory uh, at this point. And I was like, you know, who had won congressional, but, you know, he hadn't won the British open yet or the PGA. Right. And so I, I was kind of sort of, we were talking about is he the next tiger and Rory and then, had won the BMW PGA, like leading into this. Yeah. I think. And I was like, you know, I don't know. I don't see it. I don't think he's like wants it much as tiger did. Like he's probably wants a more of a normal life. He's too normal of a kid. Like he's never going to like push himself to that extent to sort of, you know, tiger lived, breathed, sleep, ate golf. It's just, I just don't see it. I don't think he wants that for his life. And at the end of the meal, my colleague Scott at the time was goes, Dude, Rory fucking McIlroy was sitting right behind you, like at the table. That <laughs> right, you're just like going off about Rory not wanting it this whole time. I don't want to say anything, but like Rory's like right there. He's like, oh, thanks for the heads up, dude. Like, that was pretty cool. <laughs> they kind of set you up for that, too. Like, they did. Kev, what do you up. think they about think you Rory McIlroy? Wow. <laughs> so I asked Cody because Cody was living in Pinehurst at this time and uh, or in Southern Pines at the time, and I was like, hey, like, what do you remember about that week? He's like, oh, I, I got home. I got home on Monday. Uh, we were renting our house to golf channel productions and I got home on Monday from Afghanistan and then ISIS was like taking over Iraq at that time. He's like, I flew to Kurdistan on that Saturday unexpectedly. Jesus. I was like, Jesus, man. So yeah, I don't remember much. <laughs> Not really Ricky focused. Was yeah. wearing, okay. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, speaking of golf channel, like they were, they kind of went all out. They had, 
you know, they had it on NBC from three to five on Thursday and Friday. They had, you know, obviously really? ESPN coverage leading in there. And then they had noon to seven 30 Saturday and Sunday. They had Rich Burr, Lerner, Kelly Tillman on live from kind of leading that with all the other analysts, the golf fix with Michael breed was live from the driving range. Like they, they had their own, like they had like three studio shows on site. They had a state of the game thing that they did they had eight features they like all sort of just pouring money into this thing wow um different so, era yeah oh yeah yeah uh some other recollections just kind of at the halfway point i remember thinking that the wire grass was a was a little bit like too like like not enough of a penalty right like it was like 0 0.1 0 0.2 shots and it should have been like 0 0.4 i just remember being a little bit frustrated there and i think some of that stemmed from wanting to see more drama, right? Wanting to see spots mm -hmm. where Kyimer could get into trouble, and even when he had a wayward drive, he was getting a good lie, you know, out of the out it of was, the native. Right? If I remember right. It was like one out of four or five would be really yeah. bad, and the rest were like you could you could scramble your way out mm -hmm. of. Yeah, and it's kind of it's crazy looking back too. Like this is ten years, you know, this is ten years ago now. But I mean, it's kind of crazy that that was the last time that the, that the U.S. Open was at Pinehurst. They had the U.S. Women's Open that following week. Yeah where Michelle Wee is one, you know, one as well. So that was, that was big time. I think that was awesome. To, by the way, the yeah. back to back, like that was, yeah. I just remember uh, we were not following women's golf at that time. And I remember being glued to watching yeah. the U S women's open the next week. Like it was the best way to, I think they had the best ratings they've ever had for that. Like that was easily the best way to amplify that event. Good take here. Pinehurst looks awesome. It's playing fair but tough. A great leaderboard. Mike Davis may be pouring a celebratory drink over lunch. That was from the No Laying Up account. Porter, this is kind of apropos of nothing other than to say, like, say what you want about golf. We're about the only sport that Pitbull hasn't invaded. And I just, <laughs> this could have been foreshadowing DJ Khaled. Right? <laughs> Porter was summoning the spirits. Was, yeah. Oh. I thought this was a really good one. So on Thursday, it was at 4 p.m. on Thursday, there are 75 players within three shots of the lead. 24 hours later, he tweeted, 24 hours ago, there were 75 players within three of the lead. Now there's nobody within six. And that wow. kind of summed up where, you know, where Keimer was and everything. Sally, I, I tabbed this, this, this outfit from DJ with those blue. That looks like something you would have been wearing. No, that's not, does not look like something I'd be wearing. I literally probably bought this exact same outfit. Like I, I, <laughs> I was obsessed with the DJ blue in this time period. Here's uh here's like poofs of like, that's mm. like, that makes me, I saw it. Like I was, I was rewatching some of the rounds. Oh. And stuff, and I'm like, and Keimer's wearing these, like, so for those listening, it's just this massive poof of dust and dirt on an iron shot of just makes me want to go play golf. Makes me want to go hit iron shots. Makes me want to go to Pinehurst. Right. Keimer's wearing white pants. I think he wore white pants the first day. I think this is like the third day. Uh, and he's wearing those kind of streetwear Adidas shoes that didn't look like golf shoes that were kind of all the rage at the time. A lot of white belts in this event too. Yep. Sally, here's a few more, a few more tweets here. Just, oh just getting off, getting off Nicholson jokes. The FBI is going to have to reopen their insider trading investigation. <laughs> if Phil tries to cash a 40 to one ticket on Keimer golf coverage being legit excruciating uh lefty looks dialed in eager to see how he progresses he didn't progress and then i'm glad to see brooks kept on the leaderboard and hope he shows out this weekend for america to see future u.s star speaking of outfits call, Sally. uh this is keegan's outfit uh wow. will you apologize kbv uh yeah, i mean that, that kind of slaps for those you know, listening there. it's keegan wearing a high top like bright red Jordans, white pants, white belt, red shirt, bright red hat. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's a lot. 2014 um, was a big ma like matching color theme. Like there was a lot of this like solid coloring going on, more on the Nike side than anything. But uh, this looking is looking at this period. too, you see three towers back behind. This is this is the ninth green. You see three towers back there. You see like having been to Pinehurst a bunch in the last six seven eight years i appreciate the hell out of this hole a lot more and some other oh, holes yeah. too of just like knowing where this sits on the property and how the elevation changes work and all that like whereas i think you know watching this tournament live i just remember thinking oh this is you know this is kind of a this is kind of a flat golf course and you don't really have any context for where it, you know, stuff is is this where your boy zach makes a hole in one on that uh 
I feel I'm almost certain Zach made a hole. Zach made a hole in one. Uh, on, oh, he did. Okay, one, I didn't. Yeah, on yeah one of those, I didn't uh, have games. that. Yeah. Here's just a vintage Nola. You know, this is like early <laughs> Nola. You know. Who is Phil Mickelson? Uh, you know, there's a Jeopardy thing. This guy is probably going to get up and down from jail. Uh, <laughs> jail Sally, jokes were coming in hot this week. Yeah, yeah. I'm a little bit uh, concerned. There's all sorts of Drake jokes. And looking yeah. back, I didn't really mm. get these. Uh, how you know it's over Drake out there after Keimer's last birdie. And then, this was Drake like uh, he was all over anybody that like he was like the any team that was doing well, any player that was doing well, he always like was a huge fan of them. Like that was the okay. huge thing going okay. on in 2014. Gotcha. That, that gotcha. does not mean these are good jokes. That just, okay. I'm just explaining gotcha. the joke. I was just wondering how you you were falling out on the whole Kendrick Lamar, Drake mm. beef. And you know, if we have to worry I'm, about you at all, I'm making fun of Drake in these okay. or, or attempting okay. to. So, okay. <laughs> I gotcha. You go into round three, going to Saturday. Keimer shoots plus two, shoots 72, finishes the day with a five shot lead over Eric Compton and medium dick rick it got rick a little Fowler. dicey on that on that yeah. saturday mm-hmm. afternoon if i remember right he was yeah, shaky. yeah. so both of them rick and compton both shot rounds of 67 they were um they were the only under par rounds for the day so they were kind of heads and shoulders above everybody else that day only six guys under par for the event at this point 73.82 scoring average that day so you got dustin and henrik at t4 at minus two sneds minus one brooks nah at even speed at plus one Stenson felt like a legit contender at times. And he just couldn't stop kind of like he would go over a green here or there. It was just kind of, it was a little bit, I don't know. It was just kind of one step forward, two steps back. But yeah, I mean, Keimer, like the lead gets to three or four, but then he just always, he'll make a birdie or a, a bogey. And then he just makes two birdies in a row or it was just relentless. And, you know, round three felt like his bad round, but he's just, you know, he's just right there. So fourth round. Uh, oh, to see here, I want you to, you missed this, the squirrel thing. Do you remember the squirrel anecdote? I don't. So it's, it's like a, this is how boring the US Open kind of felt to the media on site. That was, is like a squirrel like ran over and like fussed around Keimer's ball in the third round on Saturday. And it's kind of a nothing burger, but like one of those things on TV that like they joked about a bunch. And so in the presser afterwards, uh, like a local TV reporter was like, oh, did you think the squirrel was going to see your ball? And Kymer was like, I'm sorry, what? And she was like, no, the squirrel. And he's like, the squirrel? You want me to talk about the squirrel? Oh, that's right. Because Germans and, can't say squirrel. Yeah. That's a the thing. Square? The we, squirrel? Is it a thing? I didn't that's know a that. Thing. Germans can uh, really struggle with the with the word squirrel. And so they, they kept grilling about the squirrel. And he was he gave such a sweet German quote. He was like, no, like, I mean, this is their home. Like, this is where they play. <laughs> <laughs> um <laughs> keep going no, all good so Keimer, like it's kind of just it's just like relentless like that's this that's the story of the whole tournament like he shoots 69 he wins by eight. Oh my god uh, he won by eight Jesus. yeah i thought he nine won by under, five yeah uh over compton and rick both of them shot 72 final round they're, like they're the only guys under par they're like nobody else in the whole fucking tournament's even under par nobody had even keegan Jason Day, Dustin, Brooks, and Henrik all finish plus one. Adam Scott, Brant Snedeker, Big Tex, Jimmy Walker at plus two. Keimer had it to like minus 10 through 14 holes, and then he bogeyed 16. He had an eight-shot lead up uh, through four holes that day. Ricky doubled four, and then he birdied five. Compton kind of started charging. He had closed it to four after eight holes. Like he had birdied eight and 10, and then he dropped back on 11 and 12. He had a bad three putt on seven, which like set, I'm so stoked to watch seven this year. But like Keimer, like perfect example. Bogey's 10, like he went over the green and then puts it from over the green to short of the green, like puts it off the green. And then like basically like bogey's the easiest hole in the course. And then Rick and Compton both bogey 11. And, you know, Keimer birdies 13, basically ices it. Johnny says, turn out the lights. The party is over after he birdies it on 13. So Compton finishes at 279, runner up in his second major. Keimer jars it on 18, puts an exclamation point on it. But yeah, fourth largest margin of victory in U.S. Open history. Eight shot victory, first ever to win players in U.S. Open in the same year. Other takeaways I had were just impressive stuff from Ricky. He's 25 at the time. And you know this was the year that he finished, what, top five in all the majors. Yeah. 
Uh, Keimer's second major too, which like we don't yeah. doesn't roll off the tongue as a two time major winner, but two majors in a five year span. Brooks finishes T four. That's a glimpse of things to come. Rick Riley <laughs> tweets yes. Martin Keimer versus twenty fourteen U.S. Open equals Germany versus nineteen thirty nine Poland, and we tweet, "Please stay retired." I think <laughs> I think Rick Riley was like hanging out in Italy at this point or something. He was. Uh, he just yeah. learned about World War Two, I think, at this point. Uh, yeah. I think and- the I think the World Cup was going on at the same time. Is this too? Because there's a lot of soccer tweets in the, yeah. in the timeline, and a lot of like, who was the who was the the guy that was the coach's son, Bradley? Bradley, Gus Bradley. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, or Michael Bradley, or something like that. Yeah, Gus um, was the coach. Michael was yeah. Gus Bradley was the old Jags coach. Listen, that's uh, that might be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, Team Rose made a made a putt on 18 and does like a tribute to Payne Stewart and. You know, he's it was it was interesting watching Team Rose because he's the defending champ too. He won it 2013 yep. at Marion. And so he's wearing the Ashworth stuff, kind of a previous iteration of uh Team Rose, but he does the pre-planned, you know, kind of pain tribute there. We've got Sally's really, really concerned about is the Ryder Cup gonna be handicapped this year? At this point, the only chance the US is gonna have is if they start sandbagging. Because that's you know, a good tweet. That's a good pressure. Right? I mean, yeah. Dan I did Jenkins not get hyped up in 2014. That's proof. That's evidence. I it was Dan not Dan Jenkins from the top rope on the shark here. Keimer with his six stroke lead in the final round. The only guy who could blow this is going to announce it next year Ooh. for Fox. Hashtag shark. Here's Ricky with his dad, Rod. I wish Dan Jenkins had lived through the live era. It would have been like Dan Jenkins patriotism plus his like loathing of Greg Norman would have been truly uh, enjoyable. In this kind of just, just, you know, bottom lines it a couple tweets here. It may not have been the most exciting weekend, but watching true dominance in sports is special and in, uh, uh, in and of itself, amazing performance. So not kind of, you know, shouting out uh, Keimer, not really finding fault with it as from no laying up. And then, Johnny Miller picking apart Martin Keimer as he strolls down the 72nd hole with an eight shot lead is the most Johnny Miller way to go out ever. Um, <laughs> I Keimer, that yeah. Yeah. Keimer was just like putting from everywhere. They just kept questioning it. Is he going to putt this one too, Johnny? Okay. Yeah, he's going to fucking putt it. He can't chip and he's putted it amazing the entire week. Like, why would he not be putting this? I was, uh, I remember that from, from that entire week. There's kind of a, you know, Brooks finishes T4. And that's kind of a glimpse of things to come. And really, in hindsight, it feels like kind of a Brooks layout, like knowing what we know now about Brooks with only three guys under par, like the fact that he played well there, kind of a you know, good uh, preview of what's to come. And then lastly, we just we had a you know kind of a a recap, a summary on our website. Uh, I just points five and six here, I'd like to say. Happy trails, NBC and Chris Berman on Thursday, Friday. Johnny was more insufferable than ever, and the chemistry with the with the rest of the team seemed off all week. Judging by what I've seen on the Twitter sphere, I'm not alone. Bring on Fox's coverage, whatever that ends up looking like. Just please, no Cletus. And I think, Sally, you're bylined here, but I think we're all just tossing yeah. them in from every direction. That sounds like you. But this does this sounds like you. Six. I was Gosh. keeping the OWGR this weekend, <laughs> and I came across a guy at number 62 that I've literally never heard of, Kume Oda. This day and age, with the global nature of the game and the big money events based on OWGR, I'm just not sure how that's even possible. Looks like he's played in four majors as well, but how someone can get to the top 70 in the world being completely anonymous in the world stage is curious and somewhat impressive. It's not like he was even stacking Japan tour wins. He's got two in the last two years. He just keeps banking top tens. So that's an early, early warning of, you know, we're watching out for the manipulators here. So how do I get you guys to contribute writing like that to major coverage now? That's what I would love to have a little notebook of people dumping their thoughts in. The, the whole point coverage. is stuff way harder to find 10 years later. Uh, that, that's why we put everything in audio form now these days. <laughs> what's the uh, what's the yardage for this year's U.S. Open? Any I idea? I think it's pretty similar. Pretty similar. Um, yeah, I don't think there's a whole lot um, that's been lengthened. I remember one thing I do remember, TC, when we were in Abu Dhabi in 2018, we did like uh, in the chalet, we went and met Martin Keimer. Because I, I had a 40 to 1 ticket on Keimer to win uh, the US Open as well. And I, 
I remember I was like, I told him, I was like, yeah, I'm sure you get this all the time, but I bet I need to win the players and the U S open that year. So I, I do owe you a beer. And he like kind of thought about it for a little while. And he's like, yeah, you, you do owe me a beer. Yeah. That's, that's really, that's really good. <laughs> yeah. I think one thing just to like looking at the, the setup, I just don't remember them pushing up the third hole, you know, the third tee there. I think that's like, I'm kind of stoked about them stuff that they can do with the course here, whether it's, you know, playing five, you know, play that up a little bit farther one day or mixing up something like moving nine T up a little bit or, you know, kind of having, cause I, I think like part three wise, if you play all those part threes from the tips, it, they're, you know, 219, 190, 202 and 205, like having, yeah. you know, having a shorty in there would be awesome. It's it's on the Wikipedia page. It's listed at seventy five forty three for uh, for twenty twenty four U.S. Okay, so, so that's similar. actually so as the scorecard, that's actually nineteen yards shorter this mm. year than in than in twenty fourteen. Interesting. So you see, I, I looked it up so that I wasn't making sure I wasn't making it up. Zach Zach did make a hole in one, and then did like a lap around the uh, the the green, basically uh, the ninth. Hole, uh, you would have absolutely hated the celebration that I'm looking at now around SB Nation GIF. Uh, <laughs> that was the thing I was trying to like find. You know, it's 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 10 years ago, so it's not like stuff's changed so much, but also, you know, it was like Emily K at at like SB Nation, or there's you know, there's still Herrig writing, or there's still yeah. you still got your shipnuck stuff and the Bamberger stuff and all that, but just never really seemed like this one there was there was some seminal thing and Keimer was super classy afterwards like you know just kind of very German like hey I you know I hope Bernhard's proud of me and you know I hope the Germans are proud of me but just very kind of direct and somewhat emotionless you know and and so I think there there wasn't really some singular moment that the week yeah. kind of you know honed in on it was just more of like Man, eight shots. Like that's crazy dominance. That's wild, man. That is wild. His man. swing was was filthy back then. The way he like created lag uh was just really kind of cool. Which this know. was also like after he because what he won uh in he was world number one in 2011 and then he wanted to work it both ways. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> I forgot so, about that. He wanted to get away from his uh from his fade. Yeah, switch, so, fade? yeah, I forget what it was. I think he wanted to go to a draw yeah mm -hmm. and so he could contend in augusta and then like so right. at that point going into players like he hadn't won since 2011 he'd mc'd at augusta um and really since since this us open he hasn't finished in the top 25 at the us open yeah. and you know obviously now he's the captain of my cliques no. and uh you know kind of under fire for for some of his play is this his, his exemption done is it this year or the last year of it 14 to 24 is that that's, that's a good question year. yeah yeah I, i'd be Let's curious see. if he's uh he is he's exempt in. uh recent winners tw 2014 yeah this is his last year of his winner's okay. exemption so exactly interesting. Right. sweet so, there we go there you have well, it pinehurst pinehurst is it's really really good i'm gonna go rewatch 1999 tonight uh that was I'm not going to rewatch 2014. Uh, not a reflection no, of you. any of the work that you put in here, TC. It just 99 really was that epic. And uh, I'm very much looking forward to what we consider to be a very proper test. We'll have a lot more U.S. Open preview content uh, coming out over the coming weeks. We'll, of course, have live shows during the U.S. Open. The full court press will be here. But yeah, KV will be on site. We'll be writing. We'll be, we'll be pumping it out. So. Uh, thanks everyone for tuning in for another deep dive pod TC KV. Thank you for the hours of work that go into researching this stuff. And thank you everyone for tuning in and listening. We'll see you back here soon. Cheers. This episode on Pinehurst U.S. Opens is brought to you by the Pinehurst Resort. With the playing of the 2024 U.S. Open, Pinehurst Resorts embarks on its era of serving as an anchor site of the national championship. The U.S. Open is going to return four times in the next couple of decades in 2029, along with another U.S. Women's Open uh, in 2035, in 2041, and again in 2047. For the first time in nearly three decades, Pinehurst opened its first original golf course when unveiled Pinehurst number 10 in the spring of 2024 is designed by Tom Doak. It's got dramatic elevation changes, natural sandy areas, remnants of an early 20th century sand mining operation. They just continue to invest in their present 
in their future. They had a three-phase process to renovate the guest rooms in the lobby of the flagship hotel, the Carolina. It finished, they finished that up this past spring. They debuted the new restaurant, the Carolina Vista Lounge, which is, has an expanded cocktail bar, a contemporary menu, unlike any other at Pinehurst, offering guests a stylish and satisfying respite befitting the setting of the historic Carolina Hotel. Uh, and in between its most recent U.S. Opens, 2014 and 2024, it's been a huge era of evolution for Pinehurst. And that time they opened the, the Cradle, the short course. It's been wildly popular in uh, 2017 is when that opened. Gil Hance redesigned Pinehurst 4. It's got consistent praise in Pinehurst Brewing, uh, housed in the original building that served as the village of Pinehurst Steam Plant in 1895, remains as popular as ever among guests and local locals alike. Pinehurst is a fantastic visit. I hope everyone gets a chance to check it out and enjoys the U.S. Open next week. Let's get back to the pod.